trend. Good evening and welcome to the June 19th Federal City Council meeting. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful uh, summer, well, just about summer. Um, we're a couple of days away from summer. Uh, feels like summer. Um, so um, uh, the first item we have, we've got a great agenda for you uh, this evening. Uh, the first item we have is the Heritage Tree Program. Uh, make a, to make a presentation, we have uh, Dominic Barrera, Executive Director of Plant Amnesty. Dominic, and a Federal native as well, I went to, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to embarrass you, I hope, Dominic, but uh, went to <laughs> Sherwood Forest Elementary, Illahi Junior High, and Todd Beamer High School. Got and, it. Yeah. Good memory. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My son just happened to have gone through those, uh, the, at least to Illahi at this point, so yeah. easy to remember. And Dominic, going welcome. To, going on to the academy, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so good evening, council members and Mayor Farrell, members of the public. Thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, like I said, my name is Dominic Barrera. I'm executive director of a nonprofit called Plant Amnesty. We are a 30 year old Seattle based nonprofit. And if you're not familiar with our work, I will touch on that briefly in a moment. But uh, again, I'd just like to mention that I am a Federal Way native. This is a really fun homecoming for me to be here. I've been in these chambers before. It's fun to be back. I even used to go to church with Councilmember Moore here. Good to see you all and recognize a couple of people in the audience. Um, but the reason I'm here tonight is to propose a partnership between the City of Federal Way and Plant Amnesty in the formation of a heritage tree program, which would actually largely mirror a partnership, an existing partnership that we have with the City of Seattle. It's quite a long-standing partnership, and it's been very successful. Um, now, to give a little more background on us as an organization, we were founded in 1987 by an arborist by the name of Cass Turnbull, initially in response to a shocking prevalence of malpruning that was becoming more and more common as the region was sprawling and urbanizing and uh, in most cases malpruning even to this day is just a case it's just a matter of ignorance not knowing the proper way to do things um, but it's pretty easy to get people to make positive changes once you can get their attention so Cass's idea was to use her humor to draw attention to this important but admittedly very obscure issue um, so that's how we started, and that's why when you look at our website, you may see some goofy things. Um, but we have grown a lot in the last 30 years. Our focus primarily now is on education. Um, so here's an example of bow pruning. You can see how unhealthy that tree is. Um, so this is what we focus on now. These are our three goals that we stick to. All of what we do fits within these three goals. First of all, uh, raising awareness. We try to be present in as many community events as possible. We have a West Seattle Garden Tour coming up this weekend that I'll be at. And then um, most of our resources, like I said, go into education. So this goes into the pri providing solutions arena, um, classes, workshops, pruning guides. And this is something relatively new that I'm really excited about. We're starting to translate all of our materials into Spanish um, to widen our audience in that way. And then engendering respect for plants and everything that they do for our communities. Um, the city of Seattle is updating their tree ordinances right now, and I've been doing a lot of policy advocacy work, and then this heritage tree program is another thing that is geared toward just respecting plants and uh, making sure that they're appreciated in our communities. Uh, so the Seattle Heritage Tree Program was originally initiated by Plant Amnesty in 1996, but the city was so impressed with it that they asked to sign on to us and so now it's officially a, a cooperative agreement between the city and plant amnesty um, that was only about 1998 that the city signed on so it's been for most of the, the program's existence um, 
I'm going to run over the application process and the selection process in a minute, but just briefly, these are some of the terms. The city, the trees can be in public or private land, but it must be within city limits. Um, each nominated tree has to be assessed by a an, uh, certified arborist and evaluated by the Heritage Tree Committee. Both of those are services that Plant Amnesty donates. Um, and currently, there are 211 certified heritage trees in the city of Seattle. So this is the nomination form. I hope people can see it pretty well. It's very simple. Uh, there's no fee. It's with Seattle. It's hosted on the Department of Transportation Urban Forestry Arborist Office website. You, a person can nominate any tree, but the owner, if that tree is selected, the owner would have to sign off on it. And uh, in the city of Seattle, the city arborist serves as an ex officio member of our committee. And that way, there's some city involvement in the selection process as well. Um, nominations are brought to the committee once quarterly. So it's only four days a year that we actually do this. And the committee will review the nominations and go out and actually look at each tree and select the ones that they believe are worthy of being named a heritage tree. Um, most of the work that follows after that is done by Plant Amnesty staff. This is a picture of a recent certification. It's got, this one had best in city designations. So there's best in city and best in neighborhood designations. It has my signature, the signature of Mayor Jenny Durkin. And people who own a heritage tree can also request a plaque, which they pay for at their own cost. And we process all the work on that end. And they can also request a ceremony. And we also take care of all the work on that. Here's a picture, or a few pictures of some Ceremonies for heritage trees. I think this is uh, one of the best parts about this program is it gives people in the neighborhood Especially in the bottom center picture. It's a tree in the backyard. So it gives people in the neighborhood a chance to come appreciate the tree and uh, There's a plaque for one of them Just above that So after designation the city again the city of Seattle hosts a registry on their website along with their map of SDOT owned trees in public right-of-way and um, exceptional trees, which are a different designation, but there is some overlap there. Um, annually, Plant Amnesty mails a condition report to the owner. We ask them to fill that out and send it back to us so we can track the health of these trees. And just to be clear, the Heritage Tree Program does not designate any special legal status. <coughs> so there are pluses and minuses to that, but mainly the plus is that it makes this a pretty easy thing to do, and there, it's not costly. Um, we still believe that officially recognizing Heritage Trees as something special, having the city's name behind that, really encourages conservation, um, encourages people to continue to care for these trees at the highest level offers a sense of pride to the owners and the neighbors and may improve property values in some cases. Um, funding initially was through grants from the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, the United States Forest Service, but there is no standing funding right now as most of this is just volunteer work on Plant Amnesty's behalf and then periodical staff work from the city. Um, sometimes we do get small grants from the city of Seattle but it's not something that we rely entirely on. So initial next steps, if the city would like to go forward with this program, um, my suggestions would be to identify which city department or office can best oversee the city's interest in the program. And that would include hosting the database and the nomination form on that city's webpage or on that department's <coughs> webpage and then identifying a representative from that department who could serve as an ex officio committee member. And then on our end, we would just need to reorganize our committee a little bit to logistically make it so that people could do Seattle tour and a federal way tour in the same day. Again, it's only four days a year, so it's uh, not a huge commitment, but we would definitely want somebody who really wants to be on board with this. So are there any questions? Uh, could you tell everybody how we first met? Yeah, actually, uh, we, we were invited to the Storming the Sound of the Salmon, which is uh, something that I had done as a kid growing up here, so I was really excited to go down. We don't have any children's programming, so I opted to just go along and try to learn how other nonprofits target their message to youth. Um, we didn't 
come out with any great solutions there, but happened to uh, run into Mayor Jim Farrell while we were releasing the salmon and just thought it would be a good time to bring it up to see what he thought. And sounds like he was pretty interested, so he set up a meeting. Very good. Yeah, it was a great day. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, young kids were going through uh, the uh, boardwalk there, and it was great to see yeah. that. And you know, I'd, I'd like to thank our folks. I saw Teresa Thurlow out there uh, with surface water management, and and uh, a lot of our personnel that were out there, uh, both parks and public works uh, people. Um, and then uh, we, we did meet, and actually there are you know quite a number. Of, did you have a chance to go back there and look at that tree behind? I did. Yeah, yeah, uh, I did. That's. Incredible. I showed my staff too, and they were awestruck. The uh, and I'm talking about there's a tree that we always look at uh, at Dumas Bay when uh, where we're there for our retreats, or we're there for a fusion, or or we're there for um, uh, for the variety of reasons that would, one would go to uh, Dumas Bay, like Knudsen Family Theater. And there's a tree in the back there, and I think everyone knows if you're familiar with the area uh, uh, to the back and to the right at about one o'clock. If you're looking out there, if you were uh, analogizing it to a uh, a clock and it's a it's a beautiful old tree it must be mm -hmm. i mean hard to tell how old it is yes yeah. certainly worthy of uh, recognition oh absolutely i i took a few pictures i wish i had included in this but there it's a gorgeous tree definitely exceptional and being an Illahee graduate you're probably aware of there's a quite a number of those big trees on first avenue just south of where the crosswalk is mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll take you out there there's another very very large tree uh of significance it, it appears to be at least 80 to 100 feet tall that that looks large yeah and uh, I really believe this is a perfect city for this because it, it's something I loved about Federal Way growing up here and continue to love every time I come visit my parents um, just how many amazing trees there are here it's very fun. green while still being so close to Seattle Deputy Mayor Honda and then Councilmember Duclos thank you and thank you for being here what makes a tree a heritage tree so uh, let me go back to the nomination form there's no uh, strict guidelines here. It doesn't have to be a certain size. It doesn't have to be a certain breed. But um, all of those things are taken into account. So if something is particularly rare, particularly old, um, of particular size for its breed, then those are all taken into account. Uh, the Heritage Tree Committee is made up of primarily profession tree professionals, so arborists. Um, so they are much more of experts than I am. And I know that, that not every nominated tree does get selected I was it, just going to ask you that yeah yeah no it's it I I'm not sure of the percentage on how many it is but it, it's relatively strict we, we really like I said there's two only 211 in the city of Seattle <clears throat> this program's been around for 20 years 22 years so our historical society has some trees that they would be interested in nominating oh good that's great to hear thank you deputy mayor thank you Councilmember Duclos and Councilmember Moore I was just going to say, I've got a huge, huge oak tree in my backyard. I'm on a green belt, and uh, boy, it is three times as high as my house. <laughs> so it's probably a heritage tree, but all I know is I just pick up an awful lot of pine cones. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll tell you before we come over, before we just go into the backyard. <laughs> Promise. All right, Councilmember Moore, and then uh, Councilmember uh, Safadasov. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Dominic, welcome back to Federal Way. Thanks. Of course, I know you do visit quite a bit, I would imagine. Um, and I will say that Decatur is better than Todd. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm looking at page six for my colleagues, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested, and, and maybe this is something that staff needs to look at or, or whatnot, but I'm really curious to how, uh, obviously, I see the slide initial next steps. Uh, but uh, I'm really curious to see how realistic and how feasible is it uh, for us to implement such a thing. Um, and that's, I don't know if you put some t time and thought into that, but um, I mean, I, I appreciate your, your, your idea and, and uh, being proactive and developing partnerships, mm -hmm. and I obviously value this, but you know, on the one hand, I'm kind of thinking, gosh, you know, we're, we're having some challenges, as you can imagine, and can we handle this? Well, it's, uh, if you notice that on that second, um, can you go to slide six, please? Or page six? It's the initial next steps. Initial next steps, right here. There we go. So if you take a look at the second bullet, uh, there we go. Um, oh, there we go. This, uh, the third bullet point. 
uh, identify a department representative who could serve as an ex officio mayor four days per year. We actually have uh, two uh, licensed arborists on city staff, one of which is the deputy director of parks, Steve Eichert, and he is the expert on all things trees. In fact, many of the trees that we see, or all of the trees at Town Square Park, um, I was actually, it was just last week, was actually out at Town Square Park uh, with Steve Eichert. So he is, uh, when we had a rotting tree a few years ago, on the fairway in uh, on uh, in Twin Lakes, and we had a, a threat to one of the homes. Uh, Deputy Director Eichert and I went out and and assessed uh, how how dangerous that tree was. So I, I think actually the the uh, department where this would be likely housed would be Parks and uh, our, our arborist. I think uh, uh, Steve Eichert. This does not seem to be you know like a, a high intensity um, workload. And, and what about the the the, the second bullet point? Uh, host public database. I mean, what does that even look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just something that I, you know, we've got a, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, if, I think this is very manageable, even in the, um, if we've got a number of requests, um, uh, you know, our IT department can set up a, a matrix or a, a screen. I don't think that this will be much of an impact in right. regard to daily operations. And again, uh, similar to the four days per year, that the database would only change four days per year too. So it could be as simple as, it doesn't need to be Seattle's GIS map, it could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that has a list yeah. and you change it four days a year when, when we add new trees. Yeah. So, you know, very, very minimal maintenance. I mean, and Dominic, I mean, mm -hmm. any time that we can promote uh, preservation and history uh, and taking care of our lands, so to speak, uh, I think that's really important. So, um, you know, I, I certainly hope this will come through the Parks and Human Services Committee and. If there is a proposal, I don't know if there is uh, for a uh, partnership, but I mean, I think this sounds good if, if everything can be done. So. Great. I'll work with. Uh, well, actually, let's. Uh, Councilmember Sefa Dawson uh, first. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is: If we do do this, do we get to apply for the grants, or do you apply for grants? So I I would seek more funding uh, just for setup on this. Uh huh. Um, but like I said earlier, costs are also minimal. So um, we're prepared to continue, just as we do with Seattle, we eat a lot of these costs. Just as we get grants for general funds, we have memberships that support our general funds, and we pay for what we do on the Heritage Tree Program out of our general funds. So um, you know, it, it is minimal costs. Almost everything here is donated. Um, we have a network of arborists. We have a network of experts and they support the organization by donating their time for things like this. So um, really most of it is just a, a little bit of staff time here and there and that's just part of our work day. But I certainly would be interested in looking into more grants similar to the ones that we got we, when we set up with C Seattle, but that was also a much larger undertaking and a much different time. Um, so I will see what's out there to answer the question. Okay, and then at some point this will end, right? I mean, we'll run out of trees, or I don't know. I hope we don't run out of trees <laughs> <laughs> to identify. Yeah, yeah. But, right. No, I, I think that. So, how long is the duration, or what's the expected lifespan of this um, partnership? You know, you know, I don't see why there needs to be an expiration. With going back on the city of Seattle, it's it's an ever present thing. We get you know maybe ten applications a quarter. Pick three of those. And there are still countless trees that have even be, been considered. There are still thousands of people in the city who've never even heard of this program and maybe have an amazing tree in their backyard. That's what really, you know, I, I pick up my um, schools coming to an end and I, I was getting, um, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, just how time is moving on for my little guy. And I pick him up every day in front of this massive tree that's got to be well over 150, 200 years old. I mean, it's got, I, I've, you know, rarely have I seen a tree in a suburban setting that large. Yeah. And it really uh, made me think of this program. And I certainly, uh, uh, you know, people around and people that we're talking to right now can think of a tree just like Councilmember Duclo says. This is a, a great opportunity to really celebrate, um, you know, our environment, our heritage. And I think we're really fortunate to have such a beautiful tree canopy throughout the entire community. Um, and then that's actually what's really surprising is just how everywhere you turn. So uh, hopefully uh, this will be. A, w w so what I'll talk to uh, uh, council if, if there's no objection. What I'll do is I'll I'll talk to Ryan and talk about the appropriate process in regard to 
whether we need to go through a committee. Sounds like that'd be a great thing to do to go through committee and just run that process um, and, uh, and 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 have it hopefully come back on a future uh, business item. Any, I would support that. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so uh, Ryan, let's uh, um, and uh, John, we'll talk about that. And we'll uh, uh, we'll uh, talk about what happens when Steve Eichard misses a council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your thoughtful questions, and I hope to talk to you all again soon. Very good. Thank you very much. Great job, Don. Okay, uh, now it's time for um, um, Mayor's Emerging Issues and Report. I'd like to uh, give a, a brief update on the center stage uh, issue or uh, center stage uh, negotiations. Uh, after quite a bit, and I think I see we've got some uh, a public comment by folks associated with uh, center stage. After a great deal of uh, uh, negotiations and discussions, um, <clears throat> the parties have signed an agreement to extend the center stage contract for two months. Uh, the current contract expires on June 30th. The expiration will go now through August 31st, and then there will be a. Uh, uh, after that, uh, the parties agree that the City of Federal Way will run uh, Knutson Family Theater from that point forward. The, uh, also, um, uh, that will result, there's $8,300 per month uh, that is paid uh, pursuant to the, uh, uh, the agreement. So that'll come to about a little over $16,000, um, actually $16,600 uh, for those two months. And then uh, we have been working um, with Center Stage to identify programming uh, that they can do in conjunction with the violence prevention um, uh, trainings and, uh, and classes at our local schools. Uh, and that grant will be up to $5,000. And then uh, from the point of September 1st and uh, through, I believe, uh, 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 end of June next year through 19, uh, there'll be a much reduced rate to make sure that center stage uh, continues. Uh, it's our hope and our and our uh, uh, desire that center stage continue and and be um, the resident uh, theater company in that location and that they do well and and so that's uh, part and parcel of uh, uh, of that agreement and that was reached actually uh, uh, the the paperwork was signed on the agreement. Uh, yesterday afternoon. So thank you very much to uh, um, <clears throat> Angela and uh, uh, Trista and also uh, John Hutton and his folks um, at working through this and, and really just trying to find middle ground um, and appreciate council and, and your support of all that. Um, okay, so uh, that is uh, that agreement has been signed and, and is in effect. Um, so today we had the Consular Association of uh, the Foreign Consulate Association of Washington at the Performing Arts and Events Center today. Uh, we had, uh, um, you know, probably about 100 representatives from uh, all the different uh, consul generals and honorary consul generals uh, that are uh, in the state of Washington. They convened in, uh, at the Performing Arts and Events Center today, and we had some speakers talk about economic development, development opportunities. <clears throat> Steve, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Tim Johnson did a, just a phenomenal job um, at the uh, at the uh, presentation. I gave remarks, and and uh, Steve Hines uh, did as well as uh, uh, Dr. Corey with uh, Diagnose Techs, and uh, and then we had an individual from uh, the Port of Seattle who gave a presentation as well. So it was a good opportunity to uh, hear from the counselors and really uh, uh, highlight uh, Federway's role in international trade and uh, our. Uh, uh, the fact that we're open for business and we're centered on opportunity, as the sign says. Um, as you can see from the uh, sign, we had the uh, 29th anniversary of, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, other council members will talk about uh, Flag Day. Uh, the picture here is from Flag Day on Saturday. It was the 29th uh, anniversary of uh, the Seroptimus. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda, for uh, your role in that. And, and uh, there's King County Councilman Pete von Reichbauer and the scouts that are present. And you can see there that, that we, we use that opportunity to unveil what will be the future name of subject council confirmation, which I'll talk about in a few moments. Uh, right now, the uh, honorary name for 320th is Veterans Way. And I am proposing to council and uh, at the next uh, LUTC meeting in July, <clears throat> ask the uh, land use committee to uh, take into consideration uh, renaming 320th the entire distance permanently and officially Veterans Way all the way from a military road to the east to uh, Hoyt Road in the west. 
and uh, that'll be the uh, uh, the official name um, uh, subject to council confirmation the effect date I'm asking council to put it into effect next Memorial Day uh, to uh, give folks an opportunity to uh, uh, get that change uh, in the works so we didn't want to just spring it on people but this is something that's been in the works for a long time so we'll put it before the uh, uh, July uh, land use and again we'll, we'll get it out there um, and so um, uh, that was kind of fun to uh, uh, it was a little bit windy that day but we were lucky to have the Boy Scouts there to hold the sign and and good to see King County Councilman Pete von Reichbauer who is one of the co-sponsors for the event um, and uh, uh, supported and provided the tent for everybody and and uh, uh, just did a phenomenal job um, and we always appreciate Pete and the Seroptimus did a great job uh, with that annual event um, okay, so we've got the 25th annual Red, White, and Blues Festival at Celebration Park on July 4th. And for that, we've got John Hutton to talk to us about the plans for the July 4th. But before you do that, before you go there, um, it's not on the agenda, but I want to say a special congratulations to our own uh, uh, Municipal Court Judge, Rebecca Robertson, who just recently, within the past uh, few days, became the president of the Washington State Association of municipal and district court judges for the entire state of Washington. So it's a big accomplishment. We're very proud of Rebecca and all that she's done. And, and I've known her for over 20 years. So this is a real accomplishment for her. So uh, with that, uh, John, tell us about the 4th of July. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council members. Uh, we're excited. Before, before I talk about that, I just want to tell you thank you to each of you. You brought a tear to my eye with all the great talk about trees. Uh, that is really cool. Um, we love trees and parks, and they're a very important part of our community. So, uh, and you'll see some huge growth out at uh, Celebration Park. So, as the mayor mentioned, this is the 25th anniversary of uh, the Red, White, and Blues Festival. Uh, we're very excited. We put together a great lineup. Uh, the mayor and I, mostly the mayor, put together a killer soundtrack for the fireworks. Uh, it's going to be a great show. Uh, we have some great bands. Um, we have great sponsors. The Arts Commission, Waste Management, Federway Mirror, are all uh, title sponsors on this event. It Without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, it is a great show uh, planned for you. We have uh, some great bands. We have a Neil Diamond tribute, one of the best in the Northwest, called Cherry Cherry. Uh, they are fantastic. We brought the Aphrodisiacs back. They're a really fun disco band. Everybody loves them. Uh, and Spike and the Impalers will be playing. And a very special treat, we're having the Air National Guard West Coast Band, which are most of the very best um, musicians uh, in the world, according to them, uh, but I do believe them, uh, are actually in military bands. And uh, the Air Force has 26 different bands. Think of all of the different things that they play at. They are bringing the house, 26 horns minimum, maybe more than that. Uh, they are, it's going to be fantastic. They may even sit in with some of the other bands uh, to provide a horn section. So think about some of the Casey and the Sunshine Band uh, treats that uh, instead of three horns in the original, they bring in 30. Could be very, very cool. So uh, we're I excited the, about that. But, but, but I get the cowbell. I think we you do get the cowbell, sir, yes. That yeah. I, I'm in charge of We've that. had a special one made for you. Right. So. Um, so we have uh, food vendors, sports of all sorts for kids, face painting, interactive arts, family games, inflatables. Remember, it's all free. So it's a great event uh, for the entire family. Um, encourage you to uh, carpool. The parking lots do fill up. You can park you know, outside, park at the community center, park here at City Hall, um, and walk in, enjoy the walk. Uh, the mayor has asked for great weather, and I have promised that. 77 <coughs> degrees and no wind. Uh, correct, sir? That's right. Excellent. So that'll be done. Uh, it'll be a great show. We'd love to see you all out there. I know you always make an appearance. Uh, we're happy to have you there. It should be a ton of fun. We'll be doing the kids' parade again. Just lots and lots of fun to be had. Uh, and remember, this is also the year uh, that we have special Olympics so we'll have Special Olympics playing the day before and the day after so we'll be working through the night to clean the place up and make it look perfect and I want to say a special thanks to uh, all the volunteer groups that helped us out on Parks Appreciation Day and since that we've had several volunteer uh, events since then to clean that park it looks so nice right now it is just literally popping uh, with with being beautiful ready for both red white and blues and especially for uh, all the people that are coming for uh, for the Special Olympics. So we're very excited. It's going to be a great summer and a very, very busy week. Great. Tell us about uh, any council, any questions about uh, the uh, fireworks, uh, red, white, and blues? What time does it start again? Uh, the event starts at 4 o'clock, and uh, it, it will run fireworks shoot promptly at 10.15. Great, great. 
Um, okay, and then can you tell everybody about uh, uh, the Panther Lake Trail ceremonial groundbreaking this Thursday? Absolutely. I uh, hope to see you all there. We're very excited about this. It's been a long time coming, as uh, Councilmember Copan can attest, uh, and, and Councilmember Moore, who are both on Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, that's been something we've worked on for a long, long time. It is going to be a tremendous amenity for the entire city. Uh, anybody who enjoys a walk under any circumstances or a run or a bike ride, uh, it is a great little area. It, it, uh, Panther Lake is largely hidden. Unless you go looking for it, it will now be accessible. It's going to be a great amenity for all the Little League parents, great amenity for people taking a break from a swim meet at the Aquatic Center. They can go out for a nice little quiet loop trail. Uh, it does intersect and link up with the BPA trail, so that's a really nice amenity. Um, and we are doing a groundbreaking ceremony on Thursday at 10 a.m. Please encourage everybody to not park at the Aquatic Center as they have a huge event going on. And so park at the Little League Fields. We've secured permission to park at the Little League Fields, and we'll be doing a groundbreaking there. It'll be a lot of fun. We have the gold shovels and the, and the hard hats ready for you, so it'll be a great photo op. And something we've waited many, many years to do, uh, the funding source on this is on almost exclusively King County levy money, so it's not city money, and it was earmarked directly for trails only. So the color of money was trails only. We're excited about this. I uh, want a quick shout out, uh, Deputy Director uh, Steve Eichert is just a fabulous guy, super bright, and uh, we're fortunate to have him as our arborist, but he also has been the lead on this project and deserves all the credit. He's done a great job and tireless work uh, on his part. Uh, council, mayor, and uh, the Parks Commission for many, many years and many iterations of the Parks Commission uh, are seeing this come to fruition, and people will be enjoying this trail by September. So uh, it's going to be a great amenity. We're thrilled. So. Great. Okay, thank you, John. You're very welcome. Um, all right, now tomorrow night, Wednesday, uh, we have the press conference for the Spotlight on the Arts. That's the 2018 uh, season preview and sponsorship celebration for the Performing Arts and Event Center. And that's, again, tomorrow, 6 p.m. at the Performing Arts and Event Center. Get a preview of uh, this coming year. Um, so report on community events. We had the Let's Paint uh, 2018 volunteer event. A uh, special thank you to Shelly Pauls and Dwight, her husband, several of the council members that were present. Um, I, uh, um, and actually, there's a great picture. Actually, there's a real good picture of uh, uh, Councilmember Moore uh, helping out Dwight in the waning hours when it looked like it was the rain was still sort of pending, and he's helping out with the uh, with the um, uh, with the spray machine. And and early on, Councilmember Copang and I were were uh, doing our best to get some paint on the fence. But if you get an opportunity, uh, we have been driving by this 1,400 section. 1400 foot section of fence it's on 320th from uh you know where 21st avenue is uh, before you get to decatur high school so uh east from there all the way to about 8th avenue um uh there's a there's a 1400 feet stretch of fence that was looking very very dilapidated unpainted uh graffitied and if you drive by now, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's all painted. We had the uh, paint donated by Sherwin, uh, Sherwin Williams. Um, we had the brushes uh, donated by uh, World Vision. And, um, and it was just absolutely fantastic. We had, I think we had about four dozen volunteers from area churches. We had over 50 volunteers. Um, I saw uh, Council Member Honda and, and uh, excuse me, Deputy Mayor Honda and her husband right when we were getting started and we just, it was great. We had a lot of volunteers, a lot of city folks, and uh, it was a great opportunity to really uh, do some shine uh, of our city. And we've got a couple other locations, but I've been meaning to get that area for you know years now. We did the the first one on 21st Avenue, where we did over a thousand feet of fence in just a few hours. It's amazing what happens when we can all come together and and get that accomplished. So it's really fun to do that. We had the Rise with Us Special Olympics Rally on uh, June 9th at the uh, uh, at the um, Farmer's Market. Um, we had the Ace Hardware ribbon cutting on uh, June 15th. That was last Friday. That was fun. And um, that is pretty much my report. Um, so um, a lot going on in Federal Way. Thank you so much for everybody uh, for what you do. All right, now the most important part of the evening, which is citizen comment. Um, we've got, uh, uh, why don't I call out uh, several of these in advance and people can kind of get on deck. I've got Angela Baylor. Trista Duvall, Gerald Knutson, Joanne Paquette, first up.
Good evening, Mayor Farrell, Deputy Mayor Honda, and Council members. Um, I'm Angela Baylor, Managing Director of Center Stage. I think you probably all know me by now and are probably sick of seeing me and talking to me. But um, we just wanted to come and say thank you so much to all of the council members for your support. Um, we want to say a thank you to John Hutton and Rob Edinger and Attorney Eric, I don't know Eric's last name, um, for all of the meetings. Uh, we've tried to make it as as light as possible for a stressful situation but um, we do want to thank you for listening to us uh, going to bat for us um, and bending the mayor's ear as much as you possibly could uh, thank you mayor for meeting with us also um, we uh, are grateful for the extension and um, we view this as a challenging time uh, I'm not gonna lie it is gonna be definitely challenging for us but we are committed to being in the schools of federal way and we appreciate the the opportunity for the grant for the violence prevention so um, you haven't heard the last of us. We will be around for the next year. So we, we just wanted to say thank you so much for everything you've done for us and the coffee meetings and the every time you see me listening to me talk about how great Center Stage is. And so we're excited for the future and hope to see all of you at um, the opening of our season uh, and also to all of the shows this year. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Angela. And uh, Trista. Hey, everyone. Um, hello. Thank you so much for letting me speak again. I never assume that anyone's sick of hearing from me, unlike Angela. So here I am. Um, I just also wanted to thank the council members. I think I've spoken with each of you at some point, some at length. So thanks for that. Um, I also wanted to reiterate what Angela said. We Federal Way is really important to us. I, I've said this before, but I've lived here for almost a decade now. And it's been an integral part of my family, uh, my parents lived in Massachusetts and when they moved to Washington, they moved to Federal Way and bought a house here. And we live in the same cul-de-sac now because that's what you do when you have kids. You live as close to your parents as possible. And uh, Federal Way is close to my heart. It's been the, the only city that I've lived in for more than a couple months since moving to Washington State. So I just wanted to reiterate what I said at the last council meeting, which was that we're committed to serving Federal Way. We're committed to serving the youth of Federal Way. Thank you, um, Council Member Johnson, for having that youth forum the other week that we were able to attend and hear from them. And thank you to the council members who who listened to us and who spoke with us and who have been continually coming up with ideas. And thank you just to the people of Federal Way for being there and for being supportive of us. And, and we are gonna need that support throughout this whole year. We, we wish we could get up and say, and we're done, and it's great, and we've got all the financing we need, and here we go into next season, but it's going to be a continual journey for us. Um, but we're, if we have to take a leap of faith with any community, this is the one that we want to do it with, the one that we've built at the theater. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, and we appreciate it, and we're going to keep talking your ear off, so sorry about that. Um, but uh, we look forward to everything coming this summer. Look out for us. We're going to be at the 4th of July with characters roaming around, and we're going to be at Flavor Federal Way, and we're really excited to further become a part of this community. Thanks. Thanks, Trista. Gerald Knudsen. Thank you, I'm Mayor Farrell and Deputy Mayor Honda and fellow council members. Uh, I'm uh, speaking tonight on, uh, as the president of the Historical Society of Federal Way. Nothing related to Knutson Family Theater or center stage tonight. But uh, I wanted to just make a few comments about Camp Kilworth. It's been interesting. I mean, I like to hear the scouts up here. Camp Kilworth is a scout camp. I grew up in Federal Way and I still live here. That's a long time. But I went to Camp Kilworth. I became an Eagle Scout here in Federal Way. And I think the scouting program, the scouts are not going to be at that camp, but that camp was made for youth. And it's a beautiful piece of property, and it's got a very historic cabin on it for those. And there's a video you can, I know that, and, and we've just, they're just, we've just recognized, uh, been recognized by the state of Washington as a, a piece of property of s historical significance statewide. So, uh, I just want to encourage whatever is going on in, in the community with Camp Kilworth that somehow that be retained as a, as a piece of property that's available for our youth. And, um, and it's got big trees on it. I was down there just about a year ago just, just to take a look at it. And I just hope that the parties, and I know it's not just the city, there's a lot of other people involved, but it's hope, I'm hopeful that that piece of property can be retained and used by our, our youth and the adults. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of property that's been kind of sitting unused for quite a few years. So I just appreciate the opportunity to make those comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Gerald. And, um, uh, you know, the cabin there was either 1935 or 1936. Uh, yeah, it's 
Yeah, it's uh, absolutely just an, an amazing shape. It's beautiful and, and certainly something that's uh, on our minds. And I periodically I ask, what, what am I trying? Sorry. Uh, periodically I ask either um, our uh, Brian Davis, our community development director, or legal counsel to check in as that transition of ownership is actually in process. And so we're, we're we've got our our uh, we're checking the temperature regularly. But but those that's the kind of thing we just want to make sure that we're aware of what's going on before something happens. So thank you very much. All right, I join Paquette. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of the council, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Performing Arts and Events Center. I'm sure that's no surprise. Um, and I have some concerns that I wanted to bring up. I just found out that there is a contract that I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I have some points that I would like to see. Um, and to start with, we need to remember we're like the new kids on the block. Um, and there are other nearby facilities, such as the Auburn Performing Arts Center, Tacoma's Pantages, and even a few in Seattle that are somewhat similar. And whatever new management is established at the PAC, we must do a detailed comparison of what they offer, and not only in fees, we must be flexible in being able to provide for special requests, and we did not do that in the past. And I know that we lost some business because of it. Um, for the first few years, we must have the most attractive fees and willingness to work with potential renters. We must promote the facility more to businesses than in the past, and we have meeting rooms they probably don't even know about. And we need to keep the hotels engaged because they often get requests for information about potential meeting rooms when they're having conferences or meetings of businesses. And the hotels know a lot about that, and we didn't really do that much of that either. So, And the other thing, we really must have some kind of signage on the facility or on the wall. It's just ridiculous to not have. There are so many people in Federal Way that I've talked to, and I'll say something about the Performing Arts Center going to that, and they say, oh, we have a Performing Arts Center? Where is it? So here's this wonderful building that, and I understand there has been a sign code that's kind of limited that. Well, can you change it? You know, we really need it, and not wait for maybe in a year or two when there is naming rights. So I would just like to see the, make those points and, and hope that some of those things can happen and that these things will be in writing also. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joanne. All right. Dana Holloway, uh, then uh, Douglas Kahn, Autumn Grissett, and Norma Blanchard. Good evening. Uh, I also have a question uh, about the PAC and the contract. Um, first, a comment that obviously what we have been doing for the PAC hasn't been working in bringing in the, the revenue, so uh, having a revenue company might be a better solution. Uh, I did try to review the contract. It is a contract, so it was a little bit difficult. <laughs> but one thing I overlooked or couldn't find, and I want to bring that up here, and that was the, uh, there was no mention of the Native American culinary uh, skills education and training that I thought was supposed to be part of the PAC. And I thought that was also helped us get the funding for the PAC for the new market tax credits. So my question is, is the city, city still committed to providing the Native American culinary uh, skills uh, education training at the PAC? And when would that begin? If it's still going to be happening, then I would expect that would be called out in the contract because I would think that the revenue, uh, the venue company would like to know that because it would affect the kitchen and some of the other spaces. And if it's no longer going to be part of the PAC vision or mission, um, how will that affect the funding that was based on having that uh, culinary institute uh, provided for the Native Americans? That was one thing. Um, also would like to reiterate my statement that I still oppose IRG building any warehouses 
uh, in the former Weyerhaeuser campus and turning it into an industrial zone. Uh, this property was specially zoned as corporate park and I think that's wrong. And the last thing was having to do with the South Veterans Way. It seems a little bit premature to make that announcement when it hasn't been to LUTC or the City Council. The uh, Facebook and some of the uh, social media is all up there like it's already been decided and it sounds like tonight it's not necessarily a done deal but that's not what the public hears. You present it, they assume that it happened. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, Dan, I made it very clear that that's exactly what I was going to be presenting. And, and uh, oftentimes when you uh, present something, you got people need to see it. So I made it very clear when I spoke and, and also in the Facebook post uh, that this was being proposed to the City Council. Um, uh, Ryan, would you please uh, explain with regard to, do you have any explanation with regard to the Native American colony? Do we want to do that now or during the presentation? Um, why don't we wait for the presentation? Okay, okay. so we'll, Dana will wait on that. Um, all right, uh, Douglas Kahn. Good evening. Um, I wanted to bring some attention to we've got some legal camping. I live in a neighborhood uh, just uh, northeast of uh, Federal Way High School. We've got a green belt area, uh, and I kind of live right against it. Uh, moved down to Federal Way oh, about 29 years ago. Felt fortunate to live right next to the green belt area. It's been really nice. They had occasion we had a little bit of traffic back there, foot traffic, and then storm kind of blew in and the traffic cut down and fortunately the growth took over the few trails that were back there. Um, so the last, la last of the years have been really nice, low traffic, or practically no traffic, occasional wildlife traffic was about all. Last year, June, right around this time, uh, evening like this, we had a, a fire back there that was set by some illegal camping going on back in there. Uh, unfortunately, the fire department, the only path to the fire was going out the back of my property, so they hacked the trail down to the camp, which now provided the trail back to my house <laughs> for the last year. Uh, so now I've been having a lot of foot traffic back there. Uh, last weekend, uh, Neighbor was in the front in the front yard gardening, and somebody came, hopped the fence, and came cutting through. Mm. Um, you know, the, the fire last year. There was uh, not only did they they set the the green belt. Firstly, it was a dry before we got into the very dry period. Uh, there are also some propane bottles that ignited back there. There were like three of those big five gallon ones, uh, and that that happened in. 2016. Right? That was last year. Okay. Uh, so I mean, and, and uh, who knows what else is going on back there? Um, you now, so uh, since then, you know, I've put locks in the gates, try to min try to keep people out. I, there's ver evidence that trails more traffic than it has been. Uh, <coughs> slowly, it's growing back. I you can't grow back fast enough. <laughs> Uh, so I guess just bring awareness that it's it's going on, and I don't know what else we can do. Uh, what else is, you know. <laughs> That's it. All right, so Douglas, I just want to let you know. So uh, that location at 304th, at the intersection of 304th and Pacific yeah. Highway, that northeast corner, yes. that's actually, when I, when I went through there after the propane fire, which was, I believe, in March of 2000, and February, March of 2016, Myself and the chief, and actually uh, two deputy chiefs, and an another person on staff, we went back there. And it's a huge, as you know, it's a huge area. We're talking four to six acres back there. That's actually what was the uh, was the genesis and the reason why we started the homeless encampment cleanup initiative. And so we we cleaned. We actually that's privately owned properties. You're probably aware. And we had that cleaned up. It all cleaned up on the north side. Of 304th, and now we're aware that they've moved back. So it's a uh, we've cl we've cleaned up dozens of these camps throughout the. Uh, but what I'd like to do is the chair of the or the individual that's that's in charge of the uh, homeless encampment cleanup initiative is Deputy Chief Steve Neal, who happens to be with us. What I'd ask him to do uh, uh, tonight is uh, talk with you, make sure that we get as much up to date information as possible, and then what the current state is, and we'll go back there. I went myself back there. And it was, you're, you're absolutely right, there was a fire uh, that broke out as a result of multiple propane tanks 
uh, that exploded and endangered those houses, your houses, uh, right next there. And that really got my attention. And we really, um, that's why we engaged in the, um, uh, in the uh, initiative uh, that we have. So uh, I'll ask uh, Deputy Chief Neal to uh, get with you, get, and we'll get, to, you'll, you'll see some action. What we've got to do is make sure that we uh, don't have that kind of thing ongoing. So thank you very much. Your health and safety and the, and the you know, being you know, crime free as well is, is very important to us. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Autumn Grissett and then Norma Blanchard. Good evening, Mayor Farrell, Deputy Mayor Honda, and fellow council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I am Autumn Gressa. I'm the current director of food and beverage for SABER and SMG at the Federal Way Performing Arts and Events Center. Um, on behalf of SMG, I wanted to address you guys this evening in regards to the notification of the SPECTRA contract that is being proposed this evening and potentially the termination of our contract. I would be dishonest if I didn't tell you that I was a little upset that our contract could potentially end and effectively in my contract with the city as the vision for the performing arts and events center has just begun and it has been an absolute honor to be a part of that um our vice president sean beard emailed you some remarks which you guys can reference um and the only question that i would have for you this evening and i'm sure his sentiments are the same is how did we get from where we were to where we are now however wherever we end up Thank you for the opportunity. We look forward to what the vision is moving forward. Um, and if you guys have feedback that I can take back and be the conduit to our upper management, I will gladly receive that, whether it be now or in future. If not, thank you for letting me um, speak this evening. Great, thank you, Autumn. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. You've been a great ambassador for Save On, for Save Or. Um, Norma Blanchard. Good evening, everybody. Well, I'm here to complain. On December the 6th, there was a letter written to me uh, about uh, some logging that was going to happen in my neighborhood, right next door. And they were going to move large trees in uh, 31029 7th Avenue Southwest property, which is right next door to my property and P and D logging was going to do this. So I talked Christina Copeland, she's a repair program manager for South King County for Habitat for Humanity. She told me it cost uh, Habitat for Humanity just a little under ten thousand dollars to have the trees removed. There were seven of them. On the very corner where my fence meets the woman next door, there's a huge cottonwood tree, very, very huge. They didn't move the cottonwood tree, so I talked to this Christina and I says, what happened? Why didn't they move the cottonwood tree? Well, it's not on her property. I said, um, and who told you that? She did. Okay, the lady, the woman that lives there, can't call her lady, she not. Uh, anyway, what she did, she moved her fence in about five feet on this side of the tree so the, the, that tree would be on the other side. She tried to convince Mr. and Mrs. McKinley that lives in back of her that it was on their property. I have the papers to prove, no, it is not on their property. It is on her property. And I told Christina, I said, she lied. She does that very often to get her own way. So. We need help. I can't afford to pay. I mean, I'm not going to afford to pay, have that damn tree removed. Because it's not on my property. McKinley's, it's not on their property either. It's on Lynn Bennett's property. And I didn't know Habitat for Humanity did that. Because if I'd known about it, I would have been talking to her. I showed her the property lines that goes from my property 304, 308, no, 304. Anyway, it's a straight shot. So she moved her inside. Then another problem I have, I have turned her in for um, ivy coming through my fence. She ignores it. The last time I turned it into code compliance, they ignored it. They didn't have time. 
now she's got a large barbecue that's about so far away from my fence, and I've asked her to move it. She won't. So, hey, I need help from the city. If we got code compliance, let's use them. Send them out to my house. I'll show them. All right. Thank you, Norma. I'll talk to yeah. Brian Davis about that. Brian, let's talk about possible steps. All right. Thank you, Norma. All right. Uh, Richard Pearson, and then Tim Cook, Lamont Stiles, and Allison Taylor. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Farrell, Deputy Mayor Honda, other council members, city staff, ladies and gentlemen. Again, I'm Richard Pearson, a board member of Save Weyerhaeuser Campus and 45 year and still counting resident of the federal, federal way community. Tonight marks an anniversary uh, as it was um, June 19th, 2015, uh, when several members of the community and myself met with Mayor Farrell and staff, we expressed our concern for the continued protection of the conservation status on the Weyerhaeuser corporate headquarters site following the public announcement of Weyerhaeuser to move to Seattle and sell a 400-acre corporate park. Now, three years to the date, exactly, uh, I appreciate City Council's ability to communicate with us relative to current developments in IRG corporate park property as a result of Council's action in 2014, revising the 1994 regulations, opening citizen Council dialogue on complex zoning processes, as is occurring currently with the permit application for the five warehouses in the corporate park. These five warehouse applications are roughly equivalent equivalent to the footprint of the Federal Way Commons Shopping Center, removing almost 200 acres of forest, some with possible heritage trees, as we talked about earlier today, uh, burdening our already existing thoroughfares with almost 1,000 trucks per day by the developer's estimate, and putting in jeopardy public access to the trails, forest, and meadows the public has experienced and benefited from for almost 50 years of Weyerhaeuser ownership. As, in, as an aside, um, I hike those trails uh, considerably, and virtually all the current trailer users that I talk with do not know that the tra trails are in jeopardy of being permanently closed. Currently, there exist approximately seven miles of trails through the campus. Permitting of the five warehouse warehouse sites and their sales to separate owners, building site clearing, and diverse business objectives will result in the elimination of virtually all of these trails. We seek your help to find a way we can obtain permanent public easements on the major trails that connect the Rhododendron Garden and Bonsai Museum with the Warhauser Pond, North Lake, and downtown Federal Way. What are your thoughts on how we can expand the dialogue with you to find a solution that will be consistent with the 1994 annexation agreement with the city requir requiring the recognition of the uniqueness of the site and to ensure optimal development while preserving the unique natural future features of the site? Thanks, sir. All right. Uh, Tim Cook. Mayor Farrell, uh, Deputy Mayor, Council Member, and all esteemed in the room. Uh, my name is Tim Cook, and I'm a 20-year resident of the North Lake neighborhood over there uh, on the side there. And I just wanted to come up tonight. I was compelled to thank you for, uh, for making the announcement and doing the presentation last week of how far we're moving forward with the IRG uh, process. Um, it was very informative, and I think... Uh, and I, my opinion is I really hope that that comes out in their favor because I feel that their property rights have been really been diminished through all of this process in the time period of these last two years. And also I think it has been very uh, insightful that uh, turning uh, over to a, a number four process with the hearing aid examiner. Uh, cause so hopefully we can cut back on the, uh, of the yay, yay, and the nay, nay, and the blah, blah 
uh, in the city council member uh, meetings. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tim. Um, Lamont Stiles, and then Allison Taylor. And then after Allison, I'm out of pink sheets. So if anybody else wants to talk, please fill the one out. Mr. Stiles. Hello, everybody. All praise to the most high. Just glad to be here. I never know what I want to talk about when I get up here. It's just whatever leads me. But I had a story. One of my coworkers he, uh, the other day, he was coming out of work, and um, he was getting on the bus, and he got apprehended. And, um, you know, they were putting him in the back of the car or whatever. And he just was telling, telling us a story. He was like, oh, yeah. You know, I knew I didn't do anything, so I was good. So I wasn't worried about anything. So after they did everything they were going to do, the security from the mall was like, he works here. Like, that's the wrong guy. So, you know, they let him go. And as he's telling us a story, I'm just like, that's messed up. And he was like, it could have been worse. They could have shot me. And I was like, huh, wow. Like, that's where we at. You know what I'm saying? That's what we think when we get apprehended or catching the bus from work or whatever the case. But there's so many issues. There's the homelessness. There's the, the drug addiction. There's the, the mental health. And as I walk the streets, as I work at the mall and I see all of this stuff, and I'm just like, what's the solution? So, you know, you sit in the meetings and you go to the meetings mm -hmm. and I see the council. You guys look great up there. I don't hear you. I ain't heard one thing since I've been here. I then went to numerous meetings. I'm like, when will I speak to the council? When will I know what they think? Oh, I got to catch them solo, one by one. There's no meeting where we can go and sit down and really politic and the public can get there what they want to say with reply, not just smiles and, hey, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you guys got the, the channel. No disrespect. The mayor, I like seeing you. I don't hear you guys, man, at all. I'm trying to figure out what you, what you guys stand for. I'm trying to figure out where you guys are at in federal way. The kids, we had a youth forum. The kids spoke. They said what they needed, after school programs. They don't want to see more police. They're speaking, man. Are we listening? We're going to continue to do the work, regardless. I live in federal way. I've been here over 15 years. We don't come here because since I've been here, I'm like, man, I don't fit in. Like, nothing has been talked about as far as where I'm at in the community, what we're talking about in the community. And we're trying to, we're trying to uh, get our voices out there, and we're trying to get more people involved, and we're trying to get more people to see what's going on. We need programs. The kids said we need programs, not more police. So you got center stage, you got Game of Life, you got all of these different organizations that are here, and are you guys listening? We want to go to California, bring all these big, you know, we got big ideas for Federal Way. What about the people that's here? What about the small businesses? What about the community, the people that's here? We deserve to be held, heard as well. So hopefully I'll hear from you guys soon. Thank you, Lamont. Allison Taylor. Um, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council. Uh, I, I'm friends with Lamont, but this is not planned for us to go back to back. It couldn't be better. Um, I came here to talk about one thing. I have seven things that I'm going to go through real quick. Uh, Jesse's event, it's embarrassing that you guys weren't there, with the exception of uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. It was a Monday night. I'm, football's not even on. You should have been there to support your brand new freshman council member. And I'm not saying this because of my role in Jesse's life. I'm saying this because he is a council member in this city. He is working with the youth. And he deserved more respect from the members of this group. Um, I sent a message to Mr. Farrell, uh, which I realized was just yesterday. So I don't necessarily ex have expected a response about the Sears building. I'm not really sure what we're doing there. Roger Flygar went to Wenatchee for the state convention. I wasn't able to go. Um, but he went to the public market there. I think it's a really great um, opportunity for us to look at if Sears is not already, you know, someone's running to jump into Sears. Um, it's a great opportunity to take small businesses and give them like boutique style areas. It could be very simple. Um, and it could really bring some business back to the mall area. I have a lot of great ideas. Um, and there's models out there. So I hope that if Sears is not already spoken for, that maybe we could develop some ideas. Um, I'm really 
sort of disgusted by South Veterans Way because I'm wondering how many people we could have fed with the money for that sign that's not even approved. And that whole, like, we have to show the people. No, you don't have to show the people. You get it approved, then you make the sign. I think we have way bigger priorities in this city than renaming a street that has a name. Um, this is a photo op. And I think it's going to be great because then the veterans that are homeless here will know where they can sleep on South Veterans Way, on the grand staircase that we're building. So uh, this is just an atrocity to me. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and that's what social media thinks too. A lot of people on social media think that it's just ridiculous that this is where our priority is at. Um, the PAC, <coughs> you guys are, I mean, the city's getting what I guess it asked for with the PAC and what people were concerned about, and now it's coming true. So I don't really know what's going on because I, I got other things to do than follow the PAC so closely. But man, it sounds like we're in a mess, and I really hope that we're not about to have to spend $75,000 to get us out of it. And if we spend the $75,000, I hope it's worth it. Um, the last thing is the RISE event. So this is where politics attaches very closely to my life, because my daughter is a Special Olympian. Uh, I thought it was a good event. I believe Special Olympics probably planned most of it. It was embarrassing to see Joe Fain here, because he is not from Federal Way. Um, it is embarrassing to see a photo op for a bunch of city council members who I've never seen come to one Special Olympic event just because they're going to be here. Um, I suggest that in the future, if you guys truly support the special needs community in this area, which is a huge community, call me. Call Mr. Hutton. He's got a great program of inclusion over there. This weekend, Shrek Jr. is playing at, uh, at, at Dumas Bay. I'm assuming you all bought tickets. But if you're really going to support a community within our community, a subset of our community, I expect it to be for more than photo ops. All right, that's the last pink sheet I have. Anybody else want to provide any uh, comment? OK, uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. These are items that have already gone through committee. And uh, um, they can all be passed in one motion. Item 5A, uh, I'll go ahead and read the items. I'll ask if council members want to uh, have a separate item pulled for separate consideration. Item 5A, minutes for the May 29, 2018 um, special meeting and the June 5, 2018 regular special meeting. Item B, resolution, retreat meadows, final plat approval. Item C, LED street light con uh, conversion project, 30% design status report. Item D, Puget Sound Gateway Program, State Route 167 and State Route 509 completion projects, local funding and phasing, memorandum of understanding. Item E, Pacific Highway South, HLV Phase 5, additional funding for construction administration. Item F, Panther Lake Trail, pervious concrete construction contract. Uh, count, uh, Council, are there any items you would want to pull for separate consideration? Uh, hearing none, Deputy Mayor Honda, do you have a motion? Yes, I move approval of items A through F on the consent agenda. Second. But a motion a second to uh, approve items A through F. Um, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, matters passed unanimously. All right, uh, public hearing. I'll open the public hearing now for the resolution, adoption of 2019-2024 uh, Transportation Impl Improvement Plan. First, we'll have a staff report from Rick Perez, the city uh, traffic engineer, citizen comment, then council discussion action. All right, uh, Rick. Thank you and good evening. Um, so here tonight to present the uh, Transportation Improvement Plan and See, so the policy question is, should the council authorize staff to proceed with the adoption of the City of Federal Way Transportation Improvement Plan and Arterial Street Improvement Plan? Um, the improvement plan outlines a six-year plan for transportation-related capital projects that is updated annually. Um, it's a requirement for eligibility for grant funding. Uh, we have to be financially constrained in that we cannot put more than what we can afford to put on for at least the first three years. Um, has to conform to air quality requirements and Puget Sound Regional Council will make that determination. Um, and this is adopted after the public hearing, which is now. The prioritization criteria were um, revised a couple years ago by the council um, and uh, level of service improvement. We bumped up the uh, uh, emphasis on safety. We now have three safety-related uh, criteria, number of collisions, 
collision rate improvement, collision severity rate improvement, um, whether it's supportive of uh, high occupancy vehicles, whether it's supportive of non-motorized users, uh, level of community support, uh, air quality impacts, ease of implementation, and benefit cost ratio. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the distribution of the, uh, of the different projects. Um, red dots are intersection improvements. Uh, the green is a non-motorized project. We have a couple of overlay projects that are listed specifically um, because there's federal money in them. And uh, then pink lines are quarter improvements of which we have none. So, oh no, we do down here. Anyway, um, so the completed projects, um, we have um, SR 509. I'll, I'll go in a little bit of detail on the rest of these, but um, 509, we added a bike lane and sidewalk on the south side. Um, from 11th place south to 16th Avenue South. Um, and um, a couple of new projects. Um, one is um, citywide adaptive traffic signal control. Phase one is already funded. Um, that was with one grant, and then we got phase two funded with another grant, um, both with federal money. And uh, looks like we're going to get uh, phase three funded. Um, and that will complete um, extending the, the adaptive control system up Pack Highway to the north and Military Road. Um, another new project proposed, um, and this is also contingent on grant funding, is a, a compact roundabout as um, Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest. Um, a, uh, location where we've had a couple of serious injuries and about, I guess it's about 15, 20 years ago, we had a fatal there. Um, we also have um, horizontal curve improvements, contingent on grant funding. Um, and this is uh, the result of our local safety plan, which we'll be presenting here in a while. Um, but basically, it was a process that uh, the state suggested we follow to come up with more systemic uh, safety improvements. And so we identified this as a potential and, and um, it's basically to bring our um, curve warning signs up to the new federal standards um, and also um, implement some potential speed reader warning signs. Uh, if you approach um, a sharp curve over a speed limit, then it will let you know. So interactive traffic control devices. Um, we're also looking at um, getting grant funding for um, overlay on Southwest 320th from third place Southwest to 11th Avenue Southwest. Another one of the same, out of the same program is 356 from fourth place Southwest and 15th Avenue Southwest and that looks like it's going to be successful. Um, and we have one, um, you know, we just completed the one project um, from uh, 11th Place South to 16th Avenue South. This would extend it, those improvements on the south side of Dash Point Road to 9th Place South, um, again on the south side. So, um, so there's been a couple questions about how the review is conducted on this um, for um, environmental purposes. So um, one of the things that in the State Environmental Policy Act, there's a thing called a non-project action that you do a programmatic uh, SEPA review. And that's what we do with um, something, because we're not proposing to actually build anything at this. This is a plan to do that. And so this is more or less a, a, a procedural issue. Um, and uh, every project as it moves forward will have its own review and the scope of that review will depend on the impacts of each individual project. So we're not trying to short circuit anything. That issue was raised. Um, and uh, there was also a question about, you know, whether or not we have staff qualified to do this. And uh, yeah, the staff that has done the review of this prepared the SEPA checklist and done the review on it on the planning side. have been doing this for more than 20 years. So I don't think we can say that we're novices at this. So with that, um, the options are to recommend approval of the resolution adopting 
uh, the transportation improvement plan as presented or do not recommend approval of the document and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation was to forward option one. The Land Use and Transportation Committee recommendation was to forward option one. Oh, so I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, so anyway, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Council, any questions? Council Mayor Copang. Rick, uh, I know that everybody is like paying attention very closely to things that are going on, which is great. I think that we're a very trans we try to be as transparent as possible. But how long have we been doing these transportation improvement program notifications? Ever since the city incorporated. Okay. It's stable. So for the last 27 years. Yeah. Okay. So we really haven't deviated from what we've done in the past. No. Nope. Okay. And just to make it completely clear. Every project that's listed on there that actually moves forward, and not all of them will. Correct. Or at least not all of them will in the time frame necessarily that we have listed. Those will all go through a full environmental review. Some of these are what we'd call categorically exempt. Okay. But we have to document why we think it's categorically okay. exempt. So, yes, there is a review consistent with state. And if there's federal money, we also have to have it reviewed under the National Environmental Policy Act. Okay. All right. But the non-significance is about it, the list. Correct. Not the projects. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Council, any other questions? All right. Um, all right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, stay, stay nearby. Do we have any citizen comment? Any citizen comment on the uh, transportation improvement plan? Last time. Citizen comment. All right. Uh, council discussion. Any, qu any further questions? All right. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Councilmember Cuphead? I move to close the public hearing. Second. Been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, the uh, public hearing is closed. And Councilmember Cuphead, as to the main motion. Yeah, I move to approve the proposed resolution. Second. second. It's been a motion. Uh, there's been a motion and multiple seconds. Um, uh, is there any discussion? All right. All those in favor of final passage? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Matter passes. Uh, all right, Council Business, Item A, uh, 2018 National Highway System NHS uh, Preservation Project. Um, first, we'll have a staff report from Desiree Winkler, Deputy Public Works Director. <coughs> Desiree, welcome. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of Council. I am pleased uh, to present the 2018 it's National Highway System, or NHS, Preservation Project Bid Award. The policy question before you is, should Council award the 2018 NHS Preservation Project to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder? The background is we received three bids um, and opened them on May 30th, 2018 for this project. The lowest responsive, responsible bidder was Miles Resources LLC with a total bid of $2,673,494. The low bid was $572,000 above the project's available budget at the time. At the June 4th LUTC meeting, staff requested and committee approved rejection of all bids and to rebid the project in early 2019. Oh, how things change in a couple of weeks. So we made some phone calls and we let our grant agency know what happened and they wanted more information. Um, and they said, you know what, we really need you to move forward with this project. And so you are being awarded another $500,000 contingent upon you move forward with the project now and obligate the funds. So therefore, staff is requesting council to award the project to Miles Resources LLC, the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. Um, so the available budget, we're off by $500 there because we have $500 more grant funding that we already received. Um, so the original grant amount was $1,644,500. Additional grant funds um, that we just got awarded of $500,000. There's also um, a need and the plan was to transfer funds from Surface Water Management Capital Improvement Fund account of $200,000. That is for storm drainage structure lid replacements and adjustments that are within the overlay area. This work is normally done by our maintenance staff. However, 
these projects are so large <laughs> um, that they just don't have the available resources to complete this project in a timely manner. So therefore, we included the work within the contract for the contractor to do. Um, and then the budgeted city funds, which were already approved, of $556,000, making the available funding $2,900,000 and the extra $500, a little typo there. So the project costs um, the subtotal of the construction contract of $2,673,494,000. A proposed construction contingency about uh, a little over 4% of $127,000. Design that we already completed at $99,500 for the um, total program cost of $2,900,500, which just gives us enough to get it done. So. Um, the options considered are to award the 2018 NHS Preservation Project to Miles Resources LLC, the lowest responsive, responsible bidder, and the amount of $2,673,494 and approve a contingency of $127,006 for a total of $2,800,500 and authorize the mayor to execute the contract and accept an additional $500,000 of federal grant funds and to authorize the transfer of $200,000 from the Surface Water Management Capital Improvement Fund to this project. Option two would be to reject all bids for the 2018 NHS Preservation Project and direct staff to rebid the project and return to committee for further action. The mayor recommends approval of option one and I'm happy to answer any questions. Council, any questions? Councilor Copang. Uh, Desiree, thank you for the presentation. I think we were all a little disappointed that we weren't going to see this project move forward uh, at the LATC committee meeting. Um, but I think we all agreed at that time that the addition, that $500,000 $500, shortfall in the project necessitated that decision. Um, glad to see it here. Obviously, these things normally go through LATC uh, before they get here. Um, but regarding the budgeted city funding, I think there's been a lot of discussion about the color of money and what, what exactly um, that city funds or those funds come from, what account they come from. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, everyone understood the source of that money. Um, I believe it's all designated funds. It is all designated funds. It was formally in our um, arterial overlay program budget. Uh, which is budgeted annually and now is currently funded out of real estate excise tax, which mm -hmm. can only be used for capital funds. So what we did is we re in that program, our overlay road program, we reduced the amount of $556,000 in order to use that to match these grants. Yeah. So basically no general fund monies that is are correct. being used. Okay. That is correct. Thank you for confirming that. All right. Any other questions? All right, uh, Councilor Copang, do you have a motion? I do. I move to forward the 2018 uh, NHS Preservation Project, uh, which, is, which is 16th Avenue South and Southwest Campus Drive, to Miles Resources LLC, the lowest responsive, responsible bidder, in the amount of $2,673,494, and approve a 4.7% contingency of $127,006 for a total of Two million eight hundred thousand five hundred or eight hundred thousand five hundred, and authorize the mayor to execute the contract, accept an additional five hundred thousand of federal grant funding, and authorize the and tr the transfer of two hundred thousand dollars from the Surface Water Management Capital Improvement Fund to this project. Second. But a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, now, item B, the Spectra Venue Management Contract for Management of the Performing Arts and Event Center. First, we'll have a staff report from Ryan Call, our city attorney. Ryan. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of Council. Um, I'm going to do just a brief introduction, and then I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Peter Zingoni from Spectra, who's going to present uh, their proposal. Um, I wanted to start off by giving a little background of how we got here. Um, in February of this year, um, the mayor expressed to me some concern that um, the PAC was not performing. Uh, he thought that it was not being managed as well as it could be. <coughs> he was specifically expressed concern about the frequency and quality of acts that were in the theater, as well as um, uh, not a lot happening in the event spaces. 
um, and he asked me to look into the option or the the idea of of a private management company to coming in to take over the facility and and manage it and operate it. So um, I started looking into that. Um, one of the first facilities that I that I was drawn to was the Everett. Um, I always forget the name of this Angel of the Winds uh, Arena in Everett. Um, which is managed by Spectra, um, which is the company that's here today to, pre to present the contract. Um, I was impressed by the performance of that facility after a very rough start um, that was rebooted by Spectra. Um, and I was also impressed with the structure of their contract and the deal that, that Everett got. I started looking into the market a little bit more and um, decided that, that Spectra was a good place to, to focus on uh, to negotiate a contract. Uh, the mayor authorized me to begin negotiations with uh, the company, um, and we did that for for basically the last four months or so we've been working on this. So um, I'm very excited about the opportunities that this presents. Um, I'm going to have a bunch of – there's a last slide that ha that actually goes over compensation at the end of this slideshow, and then we're going to, I'm sure, answer a lot of questions. But before we get to that, I'd like to turn it over to, to Peter Zingoni to go through his presentation. Thank you, Ryan, Mayor Farrell, Deputy Mayor Honda, Council Members. Thank you, first and foremost, for the opportunity to present to you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Zingoni. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Spectra. Um, I would also like to introduce a few of my colleagues that have joined us this evening. So, Tim, why don't you introduce yourselves as well? Good evening. Thank you for having us, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. My name is Tim Savona. I'm the General Manager and Regional Vice President for Spectra. I'm based out of Nampa, Idaho, a suburb of Boise, about 15 miles west of Boise. Uh, manage an account there, um, uh, an arena, an amphitheater, a horse park. And due to the success and the relationship with our client, the city of Nampa, they hired us to run and manage the day-to-day -day business at their Civic Center, which has a striking resemblance, um, only 20 years older, than, than your beautiful new venue. Um, so, thank you for the opportunity to be here. <coughs> Good evening, all. My name is Mike Lankrude. I'm the General Manager of Food Services and Hospitality with Spectra out at Green River College. Uh, we opened up a new facility out there just over uh, two years ago, and I've been managing that uh, for about three years. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So we've put together a pretty brief presentation today and just really goes over the company background, who Spectra is, our ultimate uh, organizational structure, and then it shows a little bit about our experience, our expertise in running very similar types of facilities that you have here in Federal Way. And then we'll dive into a little bit of the systems, the procedures, the training, and the resources and support that you can expect uh, to see once Spectra takes over the management uh, of the Performing Arts and Event Center here in Federal Way. Um, so just to give a little bit of background of our organizational structure, uh, Spectra, we like to refer to ourselves as the sports and entertainment subsidiary of Comcast, NBC Universal. There's also Ateros, uh, which is a private equity fund, which is the majority uh, holder of Spectra, and also owns a number of other sports and entertainment subsidiaries, including Learfield Sports, IMG Sports, Groupon, uh, Bullmore AMF, which is a number of sports entertainment uh, facilities that they, uh, operations that they also manage as well and have under uh, complete control. So as we dive into Spectra, just to give a little bit of understanding of who Spectra is, Spectra comprises of three separate divisions. We have a venue management division, which we operate in 160 facilities throughout the world, everything from arenas to convention centers to performing arts centers, outdoor entertainment districts, you name it, all across the country. We handle everything from the booking, the marketing, the finance, and we'll dive into a little bit of the scope of services that you can expect to see here as well, uh, a little bit deeper into the slide. We also have Spectra Food Services and Hospitality, which operates in over 260 facilities throughout North America, really geared around the same primary concept of the sports and entertainment concept. As Michael referenced, we're right down the road uh, at Green River College as well, and we have a map uh, coming up too to show a little bit of our Northwest regional presence as well. And then lastly, we have corporate partnerships uh, underneath the Spectra brand. And we're really specialized in the, uh, the this, uh, sale of naming rights. We've sold more naming rights than any other firm throughout North America. In fact, we've sold 27 over the last five years. Uh, we have roughly 85 clients throughout North America, really specializing in the sponsorship, 
the advertising, uh, as well as the premium seat licensing that we uh, look to entail here as, as the ancillary revenue streams will grow as we look to grow more and more business and attract more and more patrons into the facilities. As you can see, kind of our national or North American footprint, should I mention, uh, we operate all together with all three divisions, a total of 190 plus clients. That is what I refer to as the contracts that include both venue management, food services, as well as partnerships. We have a lot of combined services that we ha incorporate within our contracts. And as you can see, we represent 320 plus facilities uh, throughout the world. And, and here you can see kind of our footprint really specializing in the secondary and tertiary markets. Taking a little bit deeper dive under the microscope of our presence here in the Northwest, um, as you can see, we have a tremendous amount of uh, presence and, and support. Uh, and what that means is the resources that you're going to see. Michael's a perfect example uh, being right down the road of the support that we can provide from a food beverage perspective. Tim Savona, a short flight uh, in from Seattle, right in from Boise. But you can also, as Ryan referenced, uh, the Everett. So we see a, a tremendous amount of synergies. And what that translates to is we're on the same calls when an act goes out uh, and goes on tour. What we, can, what we can hope to realize is we're in those discussions with the agents and the promoters to make sure that we're routing uh, and we're in those discussions as we look to route uh, the similar types of facilities and the artists that are uh, running right through the, the Pacific Northwest. So that's what that really translates and that's the purpose of this uh, presentation slide. Talking a little bit of our, our experience within this kind of sector in the performing arts and events center space, as you can see, we specialize in 30 performing arts centers throughout North America. Um, we have a couple pictures here on the right of, of some of our uh, newer clients and some of our older clients as well. Uh, we also have 50 convention and conference centers as well, which um, we didn't want to make sure that we uh, turn the event space or turned our head to the event space, which we see as a, a tremendous green field um, to provide a lot of content, the day-to-day -day activity, especially on the catering side. And as we look to get more and more businesses, more and more nonprofits, more and more gals, you have a beautiful facility. And that's really what we're going to look to make sure that we're maximizing uh, the event load that goes into the, into that facility, both at the art at the theater, but as well as uh, the event space that we have. Talking a little bit of a success story, we highlighted a few here. The Sandler Center for the Performing Arts is based in Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. As you can see, we've hosted over 3,400 events and over 80, 890 patrons throughout the years. This was a unique facility that we uh, were a part of the grand opening, the pre-opening services over 12 years ago. Um, and it was really there as an economic catalyst, which we see a lot of uh, similar attributes here uh, with the transit hub right around the corner, the park right below. Um, so we see that in, in and the, the true success story is not within the building, but it's around the building, the economic impact, the quality of life initiatives that we were able to implement, uh, and the job creations that we were able to uh, institute there. Dr. Phillips is uh, in Orlando, Florida, one of the most state-of-the-art facilities to open in the performing arts sector uh, in the last year. Um, it's a terrific opportunity where we were involved in the design process. But what we were really able to get with, uh, and kudos to the, the development team, the design team, EJ and team of the technology uh, that was implemented throughout your facility here at the Performing Arts and Events Center, state-of-the-art facilities, which allows us to get creative on a lot of technology drives. For instance, um, we, on the food side, we really tried to initiate a lot of um, innovative uh, types of products to make sure that the, the, the speed, as you guys know, uh, during the prevents, during intermission, we can make sure the speed of service is there. So very similar attributes there uh, as, as Dr. Phillips as well. And then lastly, which is a really uh, great story, we took over the management of the Macon Auditorium about a year and a half ago, and it was a city-managed facility similar to yours, uh, went through a, um, you know, a, a very detailed operational assessment and audit. And as we put best practices, best policies and procedures together, maximized and really focused on driving events into the facility, we saw a $1 million uh, deficit uh, decrease in just one year of operation. So we're very, very proud uh, of that taking over for a facility uh, that was managed previously by a city, and we retained uh, close to 92% of all the existing staff. So it was a real good success story for us in Macon, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. So as we dive into the, the scope of services that you can expect for Spectra to provide, um, I want to just preface one thing before I dive really in. And it's important to know this, that you as the city of Federal Way still retain all 
major decision-making ability of this facility. We act as an agent on behalf of the City of Federal Way. So we are putting the City of Federal Way's best interests always first. So you're going to have the approval of our general manager candidate. You will have the ultimate approval of all booking policies and procedures. Um, I know one of the speakers earlier um, was referencing something along the lines of booking rates as well and rental rates and, and delineating the responsibility of commercial acts versus nonprofit world. We, as much as important as we want to drive you know, big national artists in this facility and events, we want to make sure that the community is also being represented. So it's very important. I start by diving into the scope of services by noting that as well. So what we do is we like to say we, we handle everything from soup to nuts. Um, everything from booking. So you have the resources of Tim and our corporate booking uh, department that will focus on driving content into the theater, but as well as the event space as well. Um, some of the young professional network, whether it's uh, different association business, locally in town, regional uh, business, we're going to make sure that we're maximizing and booking that facility as much as possible. Marketing sales is in our DNA. We are a sales and marketing company, ultimately being owned by Comcast. Um, it's in our blood. So we really make, one of the very first initiatives that we will do is really trying to take a deep dive into the website, making sure we're connecting with the community through via social media, making sure that the website is easy to navigate, quick, so you can click on that website and you know where the acts are going. You know who's coming into town, what the schedule is, where to purchase a ticket, where parking is. So we're making sure that the communication is there for our residents make sure that they're coming in. Finance, we handle everything from the finance. You'll have a very detailed uh, budgeting process that we will do every year with the finance team and city council um, where we are essentially building a budget. And you will have the right to, to, to approve that budget as we move forward. But you will have, after every single event, a flash report showing the, the detail of how the event happened, you know, all the, the, the P&L, the, the pros, the cons, and everything in between. You'll have access to all that, and finance is very important to us, and it's a full financial transparency as we manage, uh, you know, 95% of our facilities are municipally owned, so we take that very important. Uh, management of ancillary services, obviously there's a lot of service contracts from elevators. We'll make sure that we handle all of that. Customer service is something that's very important to us as well. We feel that the best business is repeat business, so we want to make sure that we are putting all of our customer service initiatives in act. Food services and hospitality is another um, interest, is, is something that we would look to take over as well and making sure that we're working in a holistic manner, making sure that our venue management team is talking to our sponsorship team as well as our food and services and hospitality team as, excuse me, as well. Ticketing services and box office management is something that we'll focus on as well, making sure the ease of access to purchasing the tickets are right there at the customer's fingertips. Corporate partnerships is something very, very important. I heard a, a few others uh, speak about it already, the importance of the naming rights, making sure that we're maximizing the signage in that facility. Wayfinding is something that jumped out at us and our team as we toured the facility. It's something that we'll look to implement immediately is trying to find the best cost-effective way uh, to maximize wayfinding signage so people know where the building on the hill is. So we'll really put a deep focus on that and, and tap into our resources in, in the field. Uh, human resources will handle everything on human resources. And lastly, uh, the list, uh, legal and risk management uh, for everything from uh, booking an act and, and negotiating all the deals with the events that come in. A big thing that we invest in a lot of our programs is our people. Very, very important to us. The most important piece to us, in fact. So we have a learning management uh, system that we implement uh, through Spectra. It's called the intranet. Um, that we share with all of our 160 and 300 accounts across the across the world for that matter where we're constantly our marketers and our bookers our finance team is having the ability to jump on and, and interact so you're not on an island by yourself anymore you have a question about an artist who's coming into town and what marketing tactics worked and what didn't work you can tap into the resources <clears throat> and to introspect and and see the marketing plan so we're not reinventing the wheel Customer service, I mentioned the experience is, is, is huge. We have a uh, customer service program called Great Experience, and you can see greet, relate, explore, address, and thank. It's a simple procedure that we like to implement through all of our practices, and every single employee uh, will have that uh, customer service training to make sure that we're maximizing the event experience for our patrons. Mentor program. This was funny, and this was not planned of having these two gentlemen behind me, but you're looking at two uh, examples of the mentor program and basically we pair up two different individuals that work in different sectors within our organization so they can learn uh, from each other and as we were going through this presentation deck 
Tim Savona voluntarily said, well, Michael was my mentee. <laughs> so this is a perfect example, unplanned, uh, that we have two folks in the room that, that work together during the mentor program, one on the food side, one on the venue management side. So it's a, a good story behind us right here. Um, employee survey is just an opportunity for um, our employees to have a voice within our organization, speak up in best practices and policies, making sure we implement and giving back to our employees. And a great result of the employee survey was actually our Excellence Award, which is an annual award ceremony that we provide for our employees, make sure that they're incentivized to work harder and push the needle uh, on behalf of our clients. Moving along, and this kind of wraps up our summary, and, and happy to answer a lot of the questions uh, uh, thereafter, but you know, it really just bringing this all back home and bringing it together and summarizing it is we feel um, the holistic approach is the best approach here uh, for the Performing Arts and Event Center, including venue management, food service, uh, ticketing, as well as the sponsorship, where our companies are all talking together. We have all the employees working at the same cadence, understanding best practices, and moving forward. Driving events, we're going to utilize our relationship with the big companies, the Live Nations, the AEGs, the Feld Entertainment, which is a family show entertainment, making sure that we're driving some of the non-traditional types of events. Niederlander Concerts is a West Coast promoter, very large and does a, a significant amount in this region. V-Star and Jam Theatricals, which runs a number of Broadway series that we would look to implement and bring into our, our team uh, and making sure that we're driving the events into the facility. Again, I mentioned it earlier, the aggressive sales and marketing plan. We're going to really take a deep dive into our uh, social media platform, uh, website design, <clears throat> excuse me, making sure that we're um, connecting with the people, communicating with the people and letting them know brand awareness, what's out there and what's to come. The guest experience, we focused a lot on that so far, as well as the community partners, which is extremely important to us. As much as driving the events with the big name promoters, the folks that you see, the Tacoma City Ballet, the Federal Way Symphony, the Chorale, Arts for Youth, Jet Cities, Harmony Kings, and the Federal Way Youth Symphony Orchestra is just as equally as important, making sure that they have a home within this community to perform as well. And then lastly, just the resources. You saw the slide, you saw our presence in the Pacific Northwest. You know, we just want to make sure that those resources are there to make sure that this is a successful transition and a long-term partnership moving forward. Lastly, our financial proposal. I just wanted to kind of sum up um, what we've put forth uh, on the table within our contract. This would be a five-year term with an option, your option, to extend for an additional five years. Um, what we've decided to do, it, it will have uh, two abilities for our, our fees. One is a base management fee. We've offered to waive our incentive structure in year one as we look to kind of get back on track and start driving events to the facility. So we waived incentive fee in year one. Our year one fee would be $75,000 and then starting uh, uh, $75,000 and then starting in year two, um, we would drop down to $60,000 annually um, and then implementing a uh, mutually agreed upon uh, benchmark, financial benchmark, uh, where we would earn on beating that uh, mutually agreed upon benchmark uh, in the tune of 20%. We also making sure that we're not so financially driven, we're making sure that there's qualitative measures as well. So what we've um, proposed to move forward with the qualitative measure, each of the bullet points below represents $2,000, which will be scored by you as the city. Uh, results of customer service surveys, um, which essentially the patrons will survey. Every ticket purchaser that walks through the door will also get an email right after a show, understanding how their experience was at the show. So we'll be rated on our own customer service, kind of putting our fees at risk. Uh, the tenant resident groups, we will be um, rated on a similar type of survey score by the resident and user groups of the facility, the nonprofits, how we interact, how we work, uh, and show the flexibility with them working. Um, the quality of the food and beverage services, making sure that we're showing innovative uh, menu concepts and obviously the quality of the food and beverage. And then lastly is making sure um, that we're hitting our uh, event programming and, and uh, attendance goals as well. Um, we also uh, are proposing a 15% fee on all commercial rights sales. So you would retain the 85%. Uh, the remainder of that would flow right to the bottom line of the facility. And again, making sure that we're, our ultimate goal is to lower that taxpayer subsidy. Um, and make sure we're driving new ancillary revenue. And then lastly, we are proposing to make a $100,000 investment uh, into the facility as well that would uh, also help fund the transition costs for startup, um, getting our, our staff up and, and on site, as well as uh, using the remaining funds uh, to throw into a booking fund, essentially, to help entice promoters 
agents and others uh, to help come and attract them to the facility and use to help uh, mitigate any sort of loss that they may uh, incur on the, uh, on the event. So that's it in a nutshell. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to present to you uh, and this exciting opportunity uh, to partner with the City of Federal Way. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for a very comprehensive review. Um, and then, uh, Ryan, do you have some other uh, some Well, I, I wanted to answer Ms. Holloway's question before yeah. it got away from us. Um, so she's absolutely correct that the New Market Tax Credit Program does require that we implement the Native American Culinary Institute Program. Um, the short answer is that we don't know what that looks like yet. So we do have some time to still set that up before we are required to, to have it in place for uh, federal reporting requirements. So um, basically the contract says that um, Spectra will work with us in good faith <clears throat> to facilitate that. I, we, we don't even know what the program is going to be like yet. So at some point, clearly, there's going to have to be participation from Spectra. And they've, they're, they understand that. They've been told about, about the, uh, the requirement. However, we can't put specific requirements in the contract because we don't even know what they are at this point. So there will probably be future, some sort of future agreement on this point, I guess is my point. All right. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I want to say thank you very much. I, it was about uh, late January, early February, where I became increasingly concerned about the direction that we were heading. We got a good launch, and we appreciate the work that was done to be able to launch uh, the facility. But when we turn the corner of the new year, I became, there were a number of things that I became very concerned about. And I, I appreciate the work that's, been, that's being done at the, at the facility, but I, I'd say just about February it was, just to let everybody know, uh, is when I directed Ryan to reach out to Spectra and, um, and discuss uh, uh, this. And there's been a lot of work uh, that has gone into this, and, and we're eager to hear your questions. And so uh, I just want to say thank you, Ryan, and, and thank you to the Spectra team for uh, a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, with that, um, Councilmember Moore and then Councilmember Asefa Dawson. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, j um, uh, just an opening remark and then questions for the Spectra team. Sure. Uh, first and foremost, um, uh, change needed to happen, uh, and I'm glad to see this change happen. Um, and uh, this, uh, I appreciated your your presentation. I was very thoughtful, very extremely informative, lots of information, and whatnot. I'm excited about the new path, um, and I hope that there's going to be a focus from Spectra uh, with regards to cutting hit hit and a restart when it comes to rebranding and uh, reengaging with our audience here uh, because I think it's fair to say that there's concern in our community uh, with the PAC. So I think there's opportunity there for Spectre to really step up to the table and uh, re-engage with the audience and get the audience uh, uh, excited about the PAC because it really can be an exciting tool. Uh, and I hope you've studied the history of, of how we got to this place uh, because it, it's a beautiful story. It, you know, Many amazing people came together uh, to make this a reality. And so there's a lot of opportunity there for Spectra, I believe. Um, and uh, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, the mayor, and that's you made a difficult decision, but you made the right decision. Uh, and I think, uh, speaking for myself, uh, it needed to happen. Flat out needed to happen. So I think that's a good call on your end. Um, some questions here, uh, and you touched up on this, and I, I apologize, I forgot your name. Peter. Peter, thank you. Um, and so you, you did talk about the residential groups that are part of the pack. You and I briefly talked about uh, this in the back. Uh, but for me, there's a many service organizations here. Uh, and I can't stress it enough that I understand that there's a balance of, hey, we've got it, we're a business. Uh, but at the same time, the biggest thing I've heard loud and clear is that we've had the Rotary, we've had other organizations that wanted to be a part of the pack, that wanted to have their facilities, and A, had a horrible experience, or B, it, it's just it's out of their range. Uh, and so can you just talk to that? And I just have a few other questions, and I'll move on. So. Sure, it's an important, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, y yes, I, I agree with everything you said, hitting the recharge button, the restart button. Um, one of the things that we also pride ourselves is really engaging within the community, right? So. Tim can speak to a few examples of how you are the sit on a number of nonprofit organizations locally in town in Nampa. Um, we, we in fact encourage it. So, getting back to the comment of reengaging with the community from the Rotary, from the Chamber, hosting these types of events, uh, but it doesn't stop there. It also uh, it will tie in the hospitality teams as well. 
the hoteliers that are local because we feel that there can be some business to driving some some new uh, revenue uh, as well as they are looking to book um, some maybe out of town business and what that does that you know you have out of town visitors that are staying in our hotels that are spending money in our restaurants shopping in our in our stores so that's the the initiative that we're going to go after um, and we will develop a very detailed marketing plan of our strategy of, of re-engaging into the community and essentially creating an open house letting know the letting the community know that we're 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 in, we're in business and and uh, the we won't rely on the phones ringing. We're going to be much more proactive in, in picking up the phone and having more of an outbound sales effort. Sure, and I look forward to watching that, and I look forward to watching the results of building relationships with our service organizations and making sure that they feel good about sure. doing business with the PAC. You Absolutely. Know, uh, and Spectra. So um, you also said something that was really, um, and thank you for your response to that. Um, you talked a little bit about this as well. I wanted to kind of elaborate and, and talk about what does this mean when you're saying this, and that's, uh, you know, you care about what's around the PAC. And mm -hmm. you, I think, touched up on it fairly great, uh, nicely. And that's, there's a lot of synergy that's going around the pack. Yeah. Uh, but when you say you care about what's around, I mean, what's your vision? What do you mean? What, what do you mean by that when you say that? So it, it actually dovetails into the first comment, which is how do we re-engage within the community? So obviously we have a big project at the Transit Hub right around the corner. So we want to make sure that we're working um, with the different authorities, the Parks Direct Department, and trying to coordinate, you know, maybe it's a pre-event a pre pre uh, function in the, in the yard in the, in the park right across the street, right down the hill, um, essentially before in a big event. Maybe it's some uh, more community efforts and making sure that we're just focusing on what the future is around the pack and making sure that we're uh, make, uh, growing the impact around uh, that facility from both the programming perspective, uh, but also the economic development side around it as well. Because what we've seen in our, in our background uh, for a lot of the facilities I use, the Sandler Center in Virginia Beach as an example, is that Performing Arts Center drove so much patrons um, into that area, which was somewhat dead, uh, essentially, uh, not a lot of activity going on. Now you got people coming in for events, and what what was happening is restaurants were opening up. <coughs> Excuse me, restaurants were opening up, so all of a sudden you saw pre-functions happening, couples going in, having a nice dinner before a show. Um, so you're seeing that activity, and that's that's what I meant around that of driving the activity around the facility as well. Okay, uh, Councilmember Sepa Dawson, then Councilmember Duclos. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is around staffing. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us how you, if you're going to absorb, or if, if the staff is going to remain city staff? And then I also want to um, um, the um, Native American Culinary Arts. I really believe even. Depending on how it's written in the contract in the future, it's a very, it's a key component, mm -hmm. and that's one of the re uh, how we even got it going. And so I believe it should not be dropped, even if there's a way to drop it. I just want to encourage you to keep it in in the system and the pipeline, because um, I think it's really key or important to have that available. I'll take the, the staffing question, and um, it's a great question. We are committed to retaining all the existing staff members. We're going to give each and every staff member an opportunity to join the team, shall they accept, um, and really just trying to give them the resources and the support and the tools to be successful. Um, you want to address the second issue? So as far as the Native American Culinary Institute goes, it's not doing it's really not an option. It is a requirement of the new market tax right. credits. So. Um, we're not leaving that up to Spectra. We're not giving up on that. It's just that there's a lot of planning that needs to happen before we can implement it. But it's it's really not an option. It would it would cost us a couple million dollars if we didn't do it. So we're going to do it. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Duclo, and then Councilmember Johnson, and Councilmember Tran. That was one of my questions. So thank you for asking that, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm familiar with new market tax credits. Actually, I had a privilege of meeting with these gentlemen for over an hour. Um, a while ago and I'm very very excited about having a company that knows how to run something like this come in and take it over so the city can get out of being a business operator and and stick to doing what we should do running a city um, I also like the idea of getting a profit from it too <laughs> <laughs> the thing that has been one of my concerns is um, it's an event center or a conference center whichever you want to call it but we haven't been very successful 
in bringing that kind of events here that would last two or three days. People from all across the country might come here, or at least from the western part of the country, and, and take hold. I know because I used to run a nonprofit, and I went to conferences all You get there, you're in a hotel room, and you go to the conference, and you have fun and everything, and then you go shopping in town because you don't want to go back to your hotel room right away. And the hotel right across the street from there is completely doing their whole place, that motel. And so I'm just uh, very, very happy. And as I said, I had a, uh, the privilege of meeting with you for about an hour about yourselves and what you do. And, and I'm really ready for the city to go back to running the city and letting somebody else run the organization that has experience in that. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Tran. Uh, my first question was just like uh, Councilmember Duclo stated around the conference part of the facility. Um, my other question is around operations and how you plan to kind of, um, you know, get into the community and, and really uh, talk about what events are going to be coming and really try to acclimate yourself to s the city of Federal Way. Sure. And so if you could speak to that a little bit. I'll let Tim speak to that as, as kind of the one responsible for hiring a lot of the, the new general manager, but also the one responsible for overseeing the account. So. Uh, good questions. Thank you. Um, so when we look at these venues, they truly are multi-purpose venues. That's how we, we attack them. It doesn't matter the size or scope of the venue, if it's an arena with 12,000 seats, if it's a performing arts center that has 700 seats or 1,500 seats, an adjacent conference space. Um, content is king in our business. Content breeds content, and it continues to have an effect on, on the venue. Um, but also on the familiarity <coughs> and the repeat business, the surrounding area. So it has to start somewhere. Um, respectfully, I don't know the, the complete history of what the efforts were before, um, but the reality is we have to pick up the phone. Um, there's a lot of um, public comments earlier that, uh, you know, pretty much every item we addressed in our walkthrough today. And, uh, um, you know, we need to be out promoting more. Uh, we need to be embracing the local hotels they have a better pulse on anything. Um, we should be their best friends. We should be their first phone call. Uh, we should be doing everything in our power to build those relationships. Um, ways we do that, I mean, it, it could be it could be Rotary, it could be Kiwanis, it could be, you know, whatever it is in the community. The community members know their community. You guys, men and women, are probably all part of different pieces of this community. You could probably all offer us four or five immediate fantastic leads um, the opportunities for us are, are you know I talked about the content game but to be fiscally responsible and and to engage all sorts of content of business um, nonprofit rates versus you know rack rates and standard rates um, you look at any major venue of whether it's a theater arena or amphitheater football stadium um, there's only so many show stopping events that occur it's all that stuff that happens that, that isn't on the news that keeps it going every day. Um, so our commitment will be, you know, full first, but all the way around. I hope that addresses your question. Hey, Councilor Johnson, do you have another follow-up? Yeah, I just had a follow-up also in terms of hiring, and this may be a question for Peter. Are, are the employees unionized, or there's, are there any opportunities for apprenticeships or local hires? How does that work? It is, it is, it, I believe it is not a union market, but we would certainly implement um, a lot of internship programs, which is something that we do very frequently in a lot of our facilities on the ground, is working with local uh, university and colleges to make sure that there's internship programs. Um, so we're certainly going to look to uh, tap into those resources as well. Thank you. Councilman Tran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <coughs> Peter, thank you. Thank you uh, for being here, and uh, thank you to, to your team. Um, I think the decision for the city to uh, go with the professional, you know, management company uh, to manage the pack is a good decision, and I'm fully supportive of that decision. I think uh, this is the way to do it. Um, my question is actually for uh, uh, Ryan. Uh, for the sake of transparency, um, can you? tell us and the people that watching at home why we did not allow other companies to bid um, on this uh, contract. Sure. Thank you. So 
at the end of the day, there's basically two major competitors in this field. And one is SMG, which we heard from one of their employees today. They currently hold the beverage contract with the facility and the other is Spectrum. So a bid, um, usually we bid when we're not sure who would be interested in the job and we're not sure what kind of reaction, what kind of offers we would get. We would get. And it's also uh, an incentive for people to bid against each other and get a lowest number. Bidding is not always the best way to get the best deal. So in this context, I felt strongly that the best way was to pick somebody and negotiate with them directly to get the best deal that we could. Um, that said, um, SMG was already in the facility. They had a contract, they have a contract currently for the food and beverage service. And it's not terribly great for us. It's not, it was not, uh, brilliantly negotiated, let's put it that way. And um, with that in place, um, and also the, the brilliant uh, reputation of Spectra, I thought it was best to pivot, basically, and look to negotiate. We can't have two separate vendors in the same building. It's gotta be one or the other. Um, so we were looking for a fresh start, basically. And also, it gave us the opportunity to, to renegotiate a bad deal. So that's, that was my thought process, and that's how we ended up there. All right, Councilor Kopeck. Yeah, um, thank you, Ryan. Hey, Peter, appreciate your presentation. Um, it's a couple of things. I think it's good to manage expectations, and um, I think one of the one of the the uh, shortcomings that I experienced, and I know was, was communicated to me, was a lack of responsiveness mm -hmm. on the part of the of, of the, the team over there. Um, what kind of culture does Com or does Spectra bring to um, that experience? It's a sales cult. It's a sales first culture. Everybody sells is kind of our motto. It's been our motto from the day we started. Um, so making sure that responsiveness is there is we have a 24 hour rule where, you know, there's going to be some repercussions if a client is not reached back to or responded to within the 24 hours. So without those responsive um, activities that we would take forth, um, we're not going to see business and we're going to be incentivized to grow the business. Um, and, uh, that's what, what our intention is going to be. It's, uh, it's been said that uh, <clears throat> you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Mm -hmm. um, I think obviously you guys have the opportunity to make a first impression on the community. I think um, responsiveness, um, customer service, uh, all gonna be very important components of that first impression. Um, as far as managing expectations are concerned, um, we really have not seen um, the throughput in the especially in the event side but i think or it, but also i'm sorry in the the event side as opposed to the performing performance side the performance side i think there's certainly more that can be done but i've always looked at that event side as kind of being the engine that drives the facility's revenue um what kind of turnaround do you think we could see on that space started to fill up. I mean, what's realistic sure. at this sure. point? I, I can take a stab, and Tim's probably best suited to answer it, but you know, typically in our, our uh, business, the booking cycle is anywhere from six to 18 months. So it's gonna take a little bit of a, a, a ramp period to, to build up, but typically um, where we see the, the immediate um, uh, need, the needle to move immediately is probably on the event center side. I'm more on the, the conference center side, like to Tim's point, re-engaging with the chambers and the Kiwanis clubs and really bringing that uh, organizational fraternal business back um, into the facility because that would be repeat business. Then all of a sudden we get weekly business and, and driving that. But to answer your question, and, and we do agree, I, I think that's the, 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 um, the driver of, of the facility, everybody will recognize the theater as you know a place to go watch national touring events, regional touring events. Um, so, so um, Tim, did I? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. <coughs> we don't feel our job's done until we're booked 365 days a year with every square inch. So, I think Peter hit a good point that says you know six to 18 months is the cycle. We get that that storm brewing, um, and then we're in a good place. Um, you know, I have a list here I intended to, to identify earlier, but um, a list of, of regular events that we host at our facility that's very comparable to this. Um, I should make mention, like I said, it's older, okay? So I'm comparing size with theater and, and event space. Um, but we, we have um, pageants, dinners on the stage, um, governmental, you know, meetings and forums, 
dance competitions, dance recitals, graduations, conferences, business meetings, uh, health conferences, movies, movie night. I mean, that theater is gorgeous. I bet you don't have a better movie theater in town than that. Um, you know, comedy shows, cheerleading competitions, um, spoken word, church services. We have, we have um, groups that rent our facility certain spaces, like the event space that you described, every Sunday on a five-year contract. I mean, those are things that are opportunities as we get in here and we can meet people and engage in the community and find from the people in this room, you know, from, from you all and, and your counterparts, um, ways to engage. The hoteliers is a big one. We start to brew, and then it's every, every Tuesday, or it's the first Tuesday of every month, and then the calendar starts to build, starts to build. Um, but we will not rest until we don't have any dates available. As far as the six to 18 month ramp up, I mean, I understood that um, when I asked the question because that's what I've understood to be true. But um, you guys have a lot of contacts, and uh, there is the, certainly the possibility of dates falling, uh, venues canceling or something happening, and be able to bring acts in. Is that correct? That's correct. From a from a theatrical standpoint, you know, performing arts, ticketed style events. Uh, that that space is is more in the realm of eight weeks okay. up to six to eight months. Um, we could pick up the phone right now and uh, talk to a number of agents and identify like, hey, what what routing opportunities are available in the Pacific Northwest during this time frame? You have to leave a good amount of time to, to promote and sell. So that's probably where we start with eight weeks on the early end. Um, realistically, most most ticketed style events get announced in the three to six month range in advance. Um, and and we, we'll jump right into that for sure, yes. Okay. One final question. Um, as far as I think right now we've got really a, a wonderful facility and it's like the best kept secret in town. Um, we really do need to get some signage out there. Um, you guys have the experience that can help guide us in our understanding of what's necessary to actually create the marquee that brings people in. I think it's one more selling point, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Building database acquisition is a huge one as well. A market like this, you know, advertising is not cheap. Okay. So the more people in that database, the marquee, the signage, all those okay. things. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, acknowledge that our deputy mayor actually uh, uh, was a champion of uh, privatization for this, uh, for running this facility, and our former colleague, uh, Kelly Maloney, who are, wherever she is right now, uh, shout out to Councilmember uh, uh, Maloney for her uh, prior support uh, of an arrangement uh, like this. She was an, an avid supporter of this uh, arrangement, and uh, it took me a while to get along uh, to, to come back to this line of thought. So About three Mayor. years too long. What's that? About three years too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for being here tonight. In your experience, have you ever terminated a contract with a, a city in your um, management of a theater? Um, not during the term of the contract. There's been reasons that we've um, exited or parted separate ways at the, at the end of the term, but never within the middle of a term. Okay. Do you provide your own IT? We do. Awesome. We do as well. Thomas, you should be happy. <laughs> and um, for the first year, I think it's really important that the public understands that the first year, you were already behind the ball. I mean, you know, the first year should already, or next year's events and performances should already be scheduled and tickets being sold. So what can you tell the public to expect, once again, during this first year that you are managing, if you manage this um, pack? Yeah, I, I think Tim summed it up in a, in a really good way of where the low-hanging fruit is uh, for us and what the expectations are is you can expect to get some knocks on the door and um, some uh, potential interests and pursuits of bringing some of the local business on the event side. Um, on the theater side specifically, I think we'll probably look to, to um, reach out and, and continue to reach out to a lot of our contacts within the industry to see if there's any cancellations or who's touring in the Pacific Northwest at this point to see if we can pick up some, uh, some dates in the early future and in, in the first few months, uh, certainly. But I think the expectations as we go, we will keep the public uh, up to speed on, on kind of the progress and, and what 
um, you know, as we continue to, to find new um, acts that are coming to the theater side, the event side, well, certainly that's a big part of our public relations push, as well as our sales and marketing initiative, making sure that the public, um, this is their facility at the end of the day. So we want to make sure that the public is up to speed on, on everything that's happening, the communication level is there. In your other um, experiences with other cities, have you had local performing groups that you've worked with, and has it been a good experience? Have they been happy? Have they had any concerns or complaints? Local performing arts groups? Right. Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. The, the musical theaters, um, you know, run by local actors and actresses, uh, providing performances to the community, whether it's a free show, whether it's, you know, an $8 ticket. Um, that, to us, that defines community. Um, and that's what we want to be about. So we want to be the, the welcoming spot and the home for as many groups like that as possible. Even your daughter's ballet class, um, we would welcome that business. One thing I wanted to just add to the to, to previous question is, um, what can the community expect or what, what should they understand? Um, we would encourage patience, um, but also support and feedback. You know, let us know your ideas. Um, let us know what, what you think we could be doing or who we should be engaging. We are receptive to the public's, um, you know, feelings. And we want to hear them and we want them to know that we are engaged. This is not a, you know, stay off of our doorstep kind of thing. We, we want to be engaging and we want the feedback. This is Federal Way's venue. This is your venue. We hope to have the privilege to run it every day for you. Thank you. That sounds good. And my daughter's dance group is there, Tacoma City Ballet. Um, she danced there a long time ago. <laughs> I have one last question, and this was something I have asked for for the last um, since we've been open, and I haven't haven't uh, really gotten it from from our staff. But you mentioned that after every performance, you will have a report of how many seats were sold and. What other information? And then you'll give that to the city? Uh, what we give to the city is ultimately up to discussion of what you want. Okay. Um, we have everything. Every event, we have detailed event summaries. We have what we call flash reports. We net out all of our events so we can, we can identify what a bottom line impact is on everything we do. Whereas, you know, typically in a governmental entity, you, you gross everything up. You have revenues and expenses and... Whatever happens, happens. We're going to net out every event. You're going to be able to see line item by line item how much was spent on event staff, how much was spent on, you know, paper goods and things of that sort. We have ticket audits that go with the events. Um, we we have all the data in the ticketing system to re-engage. Um, pretty quite frankly, any data you can you can think of, we probably are tracking. Okay. Thank you very much. That's great to hear, Councilman Moore. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, just three quick questions for you. Um, uh, you know, you talk a lot about partnerships. You talk about a lot about relationships. Um, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we have Dumas Bay uh, and then Family Newton Theater, uh, and now Center Stage being um, a, a what's um, resident a resident uh, company. Uh, do, do you guys foresee an opportunity to collaborate and, and work together? Because I imagine. In a perfect world, that's going to be where you're booked 365 days. Uh, is do you, do you see a strong opportunity to, to work with Center Stage and and the city in that capacity? But Center Stage, yeah, absolutely. We we have an example I deal with every every day in um, in Nampa, Idaho, where we have the Music Theater of Idaho. It's called MTI, and they come in. We we book over a thousand events in that facility every year, and it could be a five person meeting all the way up to a four day conference. Um, but what this group does, the one I'm referencing, is they come in six times a year for five, six, seven days at a time and do a different performance every time. Um, they're getting ready right now to do Chicago the Musical. Um, they just got done doing uh, Peter Pan not too long ago. And then what we do with them is we work around other things and we offer them, you know, rehearsal space and rehearsal times. They're flexible with us. We're flexible with them. Um, but we try to carve out our niche and stick to our roots. So at the end of the day, we want to build those relationships and have a home for the community members that helped build the facility and establish the facility. And the hope would be that the relationship would be positive in such a manner that said, you know, we're not going to boot your dates out. We're not going to kick you out. Um, we're going to work around you. 
that's what our plan of attack is. You know, it's it's those resident groups. And just to clarify, Tony, right? To, um, Tim. Tim. Sorry, I got yeah. the T part yeah. right. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> um, so just to clarify my question, and that's, you know, we obviously have another theater yep. in Federal mm -hmm. uh, and we have a resident, you know, center stage yep. there. Uh, and just because I want to make sure I, I hear you correctly, it sounds like there is. You see opportunities to work, collaborate with them, and and. There, yes, there's there's numerous collaborative opportunities based on their needs and desires. Um, our hope would be to engage and build the relationship as much as possible. Okay. They could provide opening support for events at the PAC. You know, the PAC could provide special appearances, you know, at, at the center plate or center stage theater. I'm sorry. Um, so, yes, those synergies are realistic. They are possible. A lot of times we'll host shows that need local um, talent whether it's musicians or backup dancers or anything like that, um, the first place we want to go, we want to have those relationships to bring them to us. But. And, and Tim, the reason why I asked that question is, is that a couple years back when this was new, uh, I think there was that fear of, oh my goodness, uh, the pack is going to suck up a lot of things uh, and therefore center stage or uh, the family Newton theater is not going to have that opportunity. Uh, so that's why I'm saying, you know, is there any collaboration and whatnot? But you've already answered that question. Yeah, and I I'm mean, satisfied. Lots of that. venues. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. And then, uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed every time I've entered the the pack is that we have amazing volunteers there uh, that uh, give up their time uh, and whatnot. Is there interest in, in continuing that effort, or have you guys ever done that, or is everybody a paid staff? I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. We, we would certainly uh, look to work with uh, a lot of volunteers. We do it in a number of facilities. Um, and, and again, they would go through the same programs and, and the training programs uh, as just a, a, an employee would as well. All right. All right. Councilmember Duclo and then Councilmember Sepadas. Okay. I'll be brief. I, I just wanted, um, I was a head of a nonprofit here, and I've traveled around the country going to conferences for community action agencies. Mm -hmm. And so look at the nonprofits too as a part of it because oftentimes <coughs> we go to a conference, a three day conference, we rent a motel room and we attend the conference and then we go out to eat and then we mm -hmm. buy things in the city because we don't want to go back to the motel room that night. That's right. So look at nonprofits also. Certainly will. Thank you. Councilor Robert Sepadas. Yeah, um, I know we t I asked about the new market tax, but we have not talked about the CDBG. Section 108. So, making sure that we address that also in terms of employment. So, the Section 108 um, requirements are a little more problematic. Um, they they're predicated on a hotel being built next to uh, next to the pack, which has not come to fruition. Um, so, that that's something that we're we're gonna have to investigate. So I don't have a good answer for you on that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, excuse me, Deputy Mayor Honda, do you have a motion? I do have a motion. I move approval of the proposed contract with Global Spectrum LP DBA Spectra Venue Management to provide management services at the Performing Arts and Events Center and authorize the mayor to take those actions necessary to transition to spectra management of the facility. Second. It's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Matter passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. A great, a great presentation. Thank you Look so much. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now moving on to council reports and uh, council committee reports and updates. And uh, we'll start with Councilmember Duclo, or actually Chair Duclo, of the, uh, uh, the FEDREC meeting. Okay, I'll be very brief. Um, the first, I, no, I'll be, I'll be brief. I'm just, uh, the next meeting of the FEDREC is, uh, is next Tuesday at 4.30, and we will be meeting in the Hylobos room. There's also, we're also going to have some special meetings uh, sponsored by the, the FEDREC committee, and um, they're to look at income resources for the city and come up try to come up with some brainstorming on what we can do to have more <coughs> revenue coming in uh, uh, so that we uh, are not being sued all the time for, for actions we take against somebody else. Those special meetings will start on uh, July 9th. There'll be one on August 13th. 
one on September 10th and one on October 8th, and they will start at 5.30, and I think they'll probably be in the Hylobos room, and anybody's welcome to come, and glad to hear from you on that. And uh, I think that's it. I don't want to get into what I've been watching on TV all day about children and... and We're all with you, Dini. Right, Councilmember Moore. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm excited to announce again uh, uh, that on this coming Sunday, and I invite my, some of my colleagues, if we have a lot of my colleagues come, we have a, an issue with the OP, <laughs> what is that, Open Meeting uh, Act. I don't know what the abbreviation is. Um, but to share with my colleagues, on the 24th of June, I'm going to hold um, my event of um, lunch and listening session. It's really important that we're getting out there, that I'm getting out there, uh, to just take a pen and, and a notepad and just take notes and just listen and perhaps answer some questions. Uh, no, uh, no rules, just come have lunch at Bill and McHale's at one o'clock. Uh, whatever, whatever's on your mind, whatever your frustrations are, come. I wanna hear them, I wanna listen to them. Uh, I think it's important. I know that we're all listening, uh, but this is just something I kind of want to do uh, on my own. Uh, and so, Bill and McHale's 1 o'clock to 2.30, uh, come have lunch. If I was uh, rich, Mr. Mayor, I would love to buy lunch, but uh, I am not rich. So, uh, in, in this case, I just invite you guys, to the public, to come and support a, a great uh, local business uh, here in Federal Way. And so, um, also, um, uh, I, I am going to be inquiring more about the veteran sign. Um, I, I, uh, I do hear concerns about costs. So I look forward to learning more about that. Um, committee report, um, um, uh, gentlemen in the back, uh, I, I am the chair of the Lodging Tax and Advisory uh, Committee, uh, and so I do look forward to extending an invitation uh, somehow, or whether it's conference call or whatnot. I'll certainly be talking to Tim Johnson. I know that our hoteliers would uh, obviously love to, to connect and, and, and whatnot. Um, so um, we've been talking about a lot about uh, the Special Olympics in our committee. Uh, we've also been talking about what type of events we can do during the off seasons, which I think is a really huge benefit, and I'm really excited to be tackling that. Um, and we're talking about all the exciting things that are happening in Federway that support our, our businesses in and around um, uh, throughout our city. So uh, those are just some of the uh, big things that, that we, we've discussed. Uh, also, visit uh, visit fw.org, I believe is our website, so take, take a look at that. Um, and uh, I also uh, want to take the time, I think it's really important to note um, that um, um, I, I, I am content with uh, the center stage and, and the um, agreement that's been in place. I'm, I'm eager to see that work. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I know that you worked really hard on that. Uh, John Hutton, um, I tell you, you're a soldier. Uh, you, you've uh, kept uh, moving forward, and you've been consistent, uh, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the time that you gave to me as, as we've met several times, uh, probably in, under the most inconvenient times, but I appreciate you making the time. Uh, and to Angela um, and to your partner, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, trying to see a vision, uh, for taking a leap uh, forward, and uh, um, seeing if this is going to work, and I'm confident that it will. Um, and I also, uh, speaking for myself, I, I do want to shout out uh, to our Council Member Copain. Uh, I know that you worked incredibly hard. I know that you've been in contact with the mayor's office and uh, various parties, uh, and I know that you and I have connected, and I just appreciate uh, the, the, the fact that you kept thinking of ideas and solutions, and I think that is so important, and I know that there are times you don't like to be recognized, but this was hard work. You were committed, and I think it needs to be recognized uh, as well. And, and to all of us, I know that we all cared, um, and I know that we all want the best. And so um, thank you for your leadership on that, uh, Councilmember Copain. Um, also, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, you and I have had some good conversations lately, hearty conversations. Uh, the Homeless Task Force is... A, um, it is a good thing that's happening. Uh, and you don't need me to tell you that homelessness is an epidemic crisis that's happening nationwide. It's a big issue that a lot of people care about. 
Uh, and so um, I want to thank you for having um, uh, Sherry Edwards, who's the chair of the task force, um, and Yarden come to the Parks and Human Services Committee. I think that was a good uh, uh, conversation that we had. Um, and uh, to the, earlier today, uh, I was impressed that uh, you directed Yarden to put all items relating to the Homeless Task Force on the website of the City of Fedaway. Uh, I applaud you for doing that. Uh, I think it's really important that uh, because we're in different times, uh, people are asking more questions. Because we're headed towards a difficult budget cycle, uh, people are asking detailed questions and want to know what's happening from City Hall, as that is their right. Uh, and so what better way to ask questions when you know what's happening? Uh, and I think this is an important uh, topic that the public needs to be engaged uh, in one way or another. Um, and we as a government, it's, it's our responsibility to be open and transparent. Uh, and the fact that you took that step and directed Yarden to do that, I applaud you for that. I, I, that was important. It so, was after you and I talked, uh, uh, Councilmember Moore, and, and you had a big uh, role in that. And I'd like to thank uh, Councilmember Copang as well, and, and all of the council talking about talking about these issues. Uh, this conversation occurred in the uh, Parks and uh, Public Safety Committee that Councilmember Johnson chairs, and uh, thank you for the benefit of that invitation to those individuals. And uh, yeah, I think it was. Uh, I, I think uh, we we're getting all of the minutes and all of the uh, agenda items and everything that's produced out of that committee online and it's available and count it's been shared with the entire council and it's been shared in that public format and i think and i, I like i said i appreciate that because that uh, that not only builds confidence in the public with whatever's going on with city hall on a, such a gigantic issue uh, but it also helps us as policymakers, and you've always referred to us as policy partners. Yeah. Uh, and you know, now that we're beginning to be well informed on this issue, uh, we don't have to rush to make a decision, which I'm pretty confident will become a budgetary item. Uh, I know some people say that I may not, but I, that's hard to believe. Uh, and so uh, I, you know, my and I, I will like to talk to Yarden and you furthermore about how we can make the website, uh, uh, you know. Um, accessible to the public in an easy capacity where they can have a place to share their thoughts and their ideas. Uh, and I think that there's so much opportunity when it comes to technology. And I think we need to, it's time for us to start utilizing it. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but I, you know, uh, I, I'm just, I'm looking forward to um, having a more of a concrete dialogue so that when budget cycle comes, we are better informed and we can uh, make the best possible decision. So uh, uh, thank you so much for, for your time and uh, to my colleagues, and I will end my report. Well, Councilmember Copang, before you start, I think I owe you, the city owes you, Center Stage owes you a big thank you okay. for your advocacy of the Center Stage. I know that uh, uh, Councilmember Moore was a big advocate, but I, I want to let everybody know that Councilmember Copang was a major player in sort of bridging uh, this resolu resolution and there are so many things that, as we all know that we all we all play a part we all throw out suggestions and 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 partnership and I just I want to say a special thank you thank to you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Copang he asked a, a very insightful question <laughs> that that really moved the needle and I want to say thank you yeah. thank you too. Uh, as part of my uh, my report I wanted to give a quick uh, uh, invitation for a the LETC committee meeting coming up on July 2nd. Um, we will be talking about self-storage, um, the new standards in, uh, in preparation for the conclusion of the uh, moratorium. Um, I think it's important that uh, um, we have a good dialogue uh, around the, uh, the standards that we're looking at implementing. And uh, we do have, we did get some, some feedback from the Planning Commission, looking forward to, to reviewing that uh, as we prepare for that meeting. Um, a personal note, um, had a great opportunity to uh, go to the ACE uh, grand opening at 306 and Pacific Highway. As someone who lives in the north end of Federal Way, um, I certainly appreciate, um, I could always go north of Des Moines to the Lowe's, and it's almost the same distance as it is to go to Home Depot and Lowe's uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, uh, the crossings area. So I'm always going to go to the crossings. Um, but uh, having a, a hardware store on the north end is huge. So I'm very appreciative of Nick and his belief in, uh, 
in a federal way and his willingness to uh, invest in our community and uh, look forward to spending lots of money there uh, over the coming years. Um, uh, I will still be going to Home Depot and uh, Lowe's as well, though, so you can look forward to seeing me in the aisles wandering around there um, looking for that special thing that I so often do. I um, also want to uh, just give, a, again, a shout-out to uh, Shelley and Dwight Pauls. Um, got to spend, I've worked with them on projects for years. They were instrumental in our Paint the Fence project on First Avenue years ago, and um, again, we're instrumental in really pushing uh, pushing through on a a, a fairly a, a, just a nice project, a great community effort. We had uh, students from uh, Todd Beamer there fulfilling their community service requirements. I got to speak with a young man named Duncan, great guy, um, really cares about the community and really wants to participate in. Uh, he's a freshman there at uh, um, at Beamer, and uh, again, just those are the types of relationships that get built when you're working together. And uh, I think that's such an important part of creating community. And uh, re really appreciated um, the opportunity that um, was provided by a spark plug named Shelly Paul. So she's uh, inspired a few of us over the years. And then I also had a chance to go to the Center Stage fundraiser and really see uh, a great community of people that are committed to supporting that, that organization. And certainly look forward to great things for Center Stage in, the, in the, coming, the coming months and, and years as they continue their relationship with Federal Way. That concludes my report. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councilor Martran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't have much to report, but uh, I just want to recognize uh, Council Member Moore uh, for working uh, closely with uh, the Mayor uh, and uh, release those documents that related to the Homelessness Task Force. I think uh, you know this is one way that we can build a trust in the community by you know um, open up uh, more information and share more information with the public. So I would hope that we will continue to do this. Absolutely, Martin twisted my arm out of socket. Um, so I, 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 we we uh, we got we got it done. So thank you very much, Councilor Johnson. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I want to preface my committee report. First, by thanking everyone that attended the youth forum uh, last Monday night. Um, it was a powerful and fruitful conversation with the youth. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor Honda, for attending. Uh, all the notes were sent to my colleagues here on the council, the mayor, uh, state representatives. So it was really cool to see the youth come out. And they were so uh, politically mature and conscious about the issues in our community and really understanding the context of our city. Um, so they had some great feedback around uh, how we can be better uh, engagers of the public, how we can better um, utilize um, resources in federal way. So really want to thank everyone for attending that. Uh, next, I want to definitely um, talk about the Parks Rec Human Services Public Safety Committee. Um, last meeting, we had a discussion on the Panther Lake uh, construction, which will be this Thursday. I'm excited about that. So thank you, uh, John Hutton, for your presentation. We also had a very um, fruitful conversation with uh, Union Gospel Mission about a homelessness in federal way. We had a needs-based assessment around what our needs are in the city, and then we had uh, a task force update from Yarden and Sherry Edwards. So thank you both for uh, that update. Um, I also want to echo uh, Councilmember Moore's sentiments for uh, Councilmember Copang for the center stage uh, deal, and also the mayor um, in center stage. I'm glad we came to an agreement, and uh, just to take it a step further, really hope that we continue to support you all in federal way. So uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Copang, for that. Um, I would also like to just mention that, you know, going forward, I think with the Homelessness Task Force, it's, it's very important that the, the public does see that the, the uh, documents are on the website. So I hope that everyone in the public will be engaged with those documents and see we have had five meetings so far and uh, just continue to be engaged as we move forward um, to the final report. And just to take it a step further, I really hope that we consider uh, opening up the meetings to the public in the future. If not, um, then um, I hope that we can find another way for the public to, to be engaged with the information. Um, with that, I'll conclude my report. All right, thank you, Joseph. Council Member Stephanie Dawson. Thank you. Um, I was at the PIC Public Issues Committee meeting where um, the um, Countess N report was um, uh, was shared, and some of the percentages that they talked about were very telling. One was that 98 percent of the people they surveyed they surveyed said they would move into housing if it was available, 
And also 80% said that they need more affordable housing and rental assistance. But then also when we talk about equity, 52% 50 were people of color, wherein they represent 33% 33, 33 of the whole population. So there's a huge disparity right there that um, we need to kind of look at from you know the lens of equity when we're talking about addressing or talking about homelessness. And I hope the task force would also um, address this um, when they're talking about homelessness and, and the issues and the problem, how to address it. Um, the, um, Oh, okay, another thing that was talked about was actually there's a regional affordable to, um, housing task force. And so I think th it would be great if there's a representation from our task force that may be a part of that. Um, and so, um, you know, that's also another way to really connect and see what we're doing regionally because we can't do it by ourselves. And so, um, uh, you know, and thank you for also, like everyone else here said, thank you for making <coughs> the documents available on our website. I really appreciate that. Um, and then, um, interestingly, interestingly, I got a call the other day from just a, uh, someone here who li who's trying to move into an apartment here, and she was told that she cannot move here, and they're not going to accept her because she's on Section 8 but they referred her to other housing um, uh, properties that they, uh, sister properties they call, they told her in other cities in our, uh, in South King County actually. And I was very much surprised because of the um, uh, income discrimination <coughs> law that is out there. And I wanted to um, ask that, but we do have a liaison, so I didn't think it was my place. So I forwarded that information, but it's really disheartening that property managers are not even aware that there is a law in place. Um, and again, it, 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 it goes into homelessness. People could lose their voucher if it takes a long time for them to. So there are so many issues that need to be addressed every time we talk about homelessness. Um, and so um, how to prevent homelessness, I hope, is also a conversation that um, the task force is having. And um, so uh, hopefully, and I don't know this, but hopefully they are going to be um, presenting at the um, committee level on a regular basis. Um, and um, Councilmember Duclo kind of alluded to this, the separation of families at the borders. And personally, and I'm not going to speak for anyone, it's just I find it very hard. I'm an immigrant. Um, I was born born. I did not come here to destroy this country. I came here because of the opportunities. And I think that's what one thing we need to recognize. People come here for the opportunities. I'm sure you can relate. Um, no other reason. And so to separate families is violation of people's human rights. May, may I just say, uh, I have been so upset about what I've seen. This is the first time in my life I have been disgusted with our country and what it's doing to people, and especially children. Children locked up in cages. I don't know how we got to this state, but hopefully we can change things and change it soon. Um, I, I, di I didn't want to get into it because I, I really got very, very emotional when I saw those children crying for their mother. I, I just don't know how anybody could do that. Yeah, and so I, yeah, it, it's very impactful and I think it, it really hurts yeah, I get, I get also emotional about it. Um, and so it brings me to um, our city. And, um, you know, we, we are a welcoming city. We did say that. And so are we also inclusive? And someone said just yesterday, I heard this, and I totally loved it. Um, they said, diversity is being invited to a party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And I would hope that we're asking people to dance in our city. You're not only welcomed, but you're also included, and you're invited, and you're a part of it. And so I've personally felt that way. I know I'm included, but I hope and I want to see other people who may not feel as welcomed to know that they are welcomed and they are invited to the table. So with that, I end my report. Thank you very much. Well said, Lydia. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor Honda. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk about Flag Day. This was our 29th year of Flag Day, and it started by a woman in the Seroptimus Club named Lynn Scow, who had a vision for Federal Way that we beco become known as Flag City USA. And this year, Flag Day, uh, the location changed to the mall from the Aquatic Center where the 50 state flags are. And I'd like to thank King County Council Member Pete Von Rockbauer for his support and my co-chair at the Seroptimus Club, Linda Persia, for her support. Um, I'd also like to thank Troop 361, Boy Scout Troop 361. On Wednesday evening, I got an email from our color guard that they were unable to come. And I had just pretty much one day to find another color guard to get them into the program. I sent an email out to the Boy Scouts here in Federal Way, and within hours, 361 volunteered. And they had <coughs> nine scouts that came and volunteered and helped the mayor out quite a bit that day. They were awesome, and I really appreciate that. So next year is our 30th anniversary, and it'll be dedicated to Lynn Scow. And uh, we will work to make sure that her memory of why she wanted us to celebrate Flag Day is remembered. I'd also like to um, talk about the homelessness um, at report that we had at um, the Parks um, Council meeting. And we got some information from the Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. And I'm going to start a folder in the council office so that anyone, um, any council members who don't come to these meetings, can look at what the rest of us got for information. Um, Council Member Duclo will be starting the FEDREC special meetings and I'll do the same thing with information at those meetings too. So I'll have Jerry Lynn start a folder that'll be located somewhere where she wants it located so that um, she can give it to you guys if you want it. But um, the first information will be this report from the Seattle Union Gospel Mission, which was really quite interesting. And I'm glad that Center Stage and the city have worked out an agreement. Um, I went to their last play, which was really, really good, Angela. It was awesome. I really enjoyed it. I would like to say that having been on the Arts Commission for six years and chair of the Arts Commission for the last three years before I became a council member, I'm glad that Center Stage worked out a deal. And I'm glad that they're getting reduced rent at Knutson Family Theater. But in that idea, I'd like to see if the city can explore how the other performing art groups that we have in the city can get some reduced rent at the PAC this year. Because every single one of them has contacted me during the past year to tell me how expensive it is to perform at the PAC. And that the PAC was built for the people of Federal Way. And so I'm glad that Center Stage has a deal, but I really think it's important that we talk to the other performing groups and see what their concerns are and what it is that they need from us so that they can continue to perform and continue to make amazing memories here in Federal Way. And my last item is um, I'm on the King County Board of Health and we have a meeting on Thursday at 1.30 in Seattle. And in 2014, the Board of Health formed a committee to study healthy housing and in 2018, we have a report ready to go that we're going to be voting on. It talks about healthy housing, uh, maintenance of housing, um, community designs, connections to health and human services, housing affordability. I have a copy of the report. I can send it to you if you'd like. And uh, it hasn't been approved yet by the Board of Health, but it, we will be voting on it on on Thursday. So it took a while to get there. It, things don't happen overnight. I think it's a good document. And I, <clears throat> it's recommendations to the cities in King County. The Board of Health can't force anyone to do anything, but it's recommendations that cities in King County can look at and follow. And uh, if anyone wants more information, please let me know. And thank you very much. I think it's been a great meeting. And um, I'm very excited about what will be happening at our Performing Arts and Events Center. I've just been very excited about that. So 
Me too. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. And with that, we are adjourned. Great meeting, everybody. <laughs>